Hunting, I was hunting for water, what I found was an empty cup. <laughs> so that's a useful thing, actually. When you're out, you are not You don't want to be... Looking for a bottle. and Mark Wise Limited and others. Yes, good My lords, my lady, um, I am James Collins. I yes. appear to go with my junior, Mr. Jones, who's sat behind me on behalf of the appellant. That's yes. fair, I will refer to as Fairlight. Uh, to my right, Mr. Pillow of Queen's Council appears on behalf of the first respondent, that is Sotheby's, yes. together with uh, Miss Wood, who's back left as you look down the court. And then, uh, rather unusual for him, Mr. Smuha, <laughs> Queen's Council, is in the third row. Looks very uh, comfortable. He does look comfortable. <laughs> and, uh, appearing on behalf of the second yes. uh, respondent, Mark Weiss Limited, together with Miss Renton, who is back in centre. So, so, my lords, my, you, you would have seen, obviously, that my name is not the name on the skeleton argument, um, uh, nor is uh, the name of my junior. However, I do uh, adopt that document uh, subject to the following qualifications. Uh, first, uh, in connection with the sub-agency point, it's said in the skeleton on a number of occasions that the authorities require strict proof in relation to the privity issue. And those words are put in quotes, suggesting that they come from a relevant authority. And as far as I can see, that's not right. 
Um, the authorities refer to the need for a, and I quote, precise proof, unquote, which phrase also appears in the skeleton. But it looks as if a sort of, a sort of error, at, occasionally that's changed from precise proof to strict proof. So, um, I, I, precise proof is only in Prentice. It's in Prentice. Is it somewhere else as well? It, it's, I think it's, it's in Prentice, but quoting from an earlier uh, authority. Powell and Thomas. And it again appears in one of the other authorities, but again, all, all originating with, from the same source, which is an authority that we actually don't have in the bundles, because when we were working through it to slim down the authorities, that yes. we didn't have more than the requisite amount. Well, I'm, on any of you, this isn't statutory wording, and this is an expression no. of a a degree of precision. Absolutely, and, and I accept that, that doesn't indicate a higher standard of proof, if you say a precise no. proof. It doesn't, it, it's still a balance of probabilities. All it means is that you need to have evidence that addresses that specific no. issue. But Mr. Collins, just before you go any further, I did mean to ask at the outset, I mean, have you been able to agree a timetable between yourselves, or at any rate, if you haven't, we, I hope you will be able to we, divide we, time up equitably between you. We have loosely, we've, we've agreed Roughly, I mean, effectively a 50 50 split of time, 50% to me and then 50% between them to share as they see fit. Yes. Uh, whilst it was recognised that because I might have to spend a bit of time introducing the documents, it may be that I slip slightly over that 50%, but that's what we're working towards. Certainly today, I am going to try to finish before the end of the day so that Mr. Pillow can start so that there is sufficient time uh, for me to reply tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so that was the first qualification um, in relation to the skeleton that I'm adopting. Uh, the second one is that I will not be relying on contra proferentum in relation to the GAV clause, that's the generally accepted views clause. It, it's referred to in one paragraph, the point isn't laboured in, in relation to the GAV clause, but I don't rely on it at all. You labour it on ground four, do you? Well, I, I wouldn't say I labour it at all. <laughs> But, uh, but I will be relying on it on ground four. Uh, and I'll perhaps... With That's tend to be rather a last resort. Well, which gets me to my, my third qualification, which is although I adopt the arguments made in the skeleton, <laughs> there will inevitably be some difference in yeah. emphasis. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Well, if you stray off piece, I'm sure um, others will be quick to <laughs> right. <laughs> intervene. But basically, you, you adopt the argument subject to the points you very helpfully my, my, my lord, I do. Thank you. Um, so, by way of introduction, obviously you would have seen, seen from the documents that it concerns a picture that at one time was believed by all the parties to this litigation to be yes. painted by Franz Hals. Um, there's now some doubt about that, but whether it is or is not a house is not an issue that concerns this court today. Um, so, what I want to say by way of introduction is firstly a few words about the parties. Uh, then I'll take you briefly through the relevant agreements um, to establish the relevant contractual framework for the arguments that we're going to develop <coughs> over the next couple of days. And then I will say something about the dispute and the judgment before I then turn to each of the grounds and address you at rather more length uh, on each of those. And, and Mr. Collins, um, my Lord has indicated there is going to be a transcript. Is that your understanding as well from the live stream? I did not know how that had resolved itself. Um, Just so we know at the outset in case it affects <laughs> How much we write down? Certainly, there's not live notes. No, so there's no. The, the, I mean, I was asked at the end of last week to give approval for a transcript, which I did on condition that was made of the, it was made available to all of us. And what I was told was it would be done from the live stream, so there were no transcribers in court. Oh. So we haven't arranged anything. I don't know whether. That's rather mysterious, because I approved an application. I now haven't got it in front of me. But I oh. <laughs> I'm trying to take some instructions on that. But of course Thank my you. My sister's not present, but we're communicating electronically. Yes. <coughs> I so rather I'm think it may well have been Sotheby's who made the application. But, um, we, we understand, those in court understand that it is being transcribed. I'll confirm, or I'll let you know if it's not. Thank you, because it does make a difference to the amount of you know, physical note-taking we have to do. And, yes. um, in fact, I'm instructed there'll be an overnight. Fine. That's, mm. that, that, there's no need for it to be instantaneous, but just to know it's there and will reach us in due course. I, I'm, I'm grateful to my learned friends. I had absolutely no idea to the, uh, of the answer to that question. And um, 
Thank you. That will, will help because I suspect it means that on some points I can take them perhaps a little bit more quickly than I might otherwise have had to if, if I was asking your Lordship and your Lady to note everything that I said. So starting with the parties, obviously Sotheby's needs no introduction. Um, the first defendant, Mark Weiss Limited, is a well-established and certainly in its field uh, a well-known dealer in old master portraits. And the second defendant, that's the appellant Fairlight, is a non-trading vehicle used by its owner, David Cowitz, to invest in fine art from time to time. Now, I don't want to labor the point too much, but the difference between uh, MWL, Mark Weiss Limited, uh, which was in the business of dealing in fine art, and Fairlight, which was a non-trading investment vehicle, is potentially significant in the context of the argument about partnership. So I'd like to show you that this is common ground on the pleadings. If, if I could ask you to take out the core bundle. What, what, what is the point that is common ground? That whereas Mark Weiss Limited is a dealer, it's in the business of dealing in fine art, whereas Fairlight is a non-trading vehicle used for occasional investment. And, and one sees that in the core bundle, tab 14. At, <coughs> uh, I suppose I, sh I should check. I don't know whether anyone, is everyone using hard copy bundles? That makes my job a little bit easier, so I don't need to give PDF references, because in some instances, uh, the PDF yes, bundles are different. That is the case for all drillers. Thank you. Um, so tab 14, at the very beginning of tab 14, you have the claim form. If you turn over behind that, starting on page 172, you have the amended, or the re-amended -re particulars of claim. And over the page on 173, I'd like to pick it up at paragraph 2. <coughs> so this is Sotheby's plea. They say that Mark Weiss is a company domiciled in England. <coughs> is and was at all material times engaged in a business as a fine art dealership, then refers to ownership by Mark Weiss, then the second defendant, Fairlight, a limited liability partnership domiciled in England, is and was at all material times a non-trading vehicle through which David Kovitz, who was at all material times the beneficial owner of Fairlight, invested from time to time in fine art. So that's Sotheby's plea. You see Mark, the Mark Weiss limited response to that in the next Tab 15, where you find the defense of the first and third defendants. That starts at page 183, and the relevant paragraph responding to paragraph 2 is on 184, and it's paragraph 5. The paragraph 5 says <coughs> the third sentence of paragraph 2 is admitted. So the third sentence is a reference to what is alleged about Fairlight. And paragraph 2 is otherwise admitted insofar as it accords with the below. It says, MWL is an English company, experienced old ma master art dealer operating out of a gallery in German Street, and Mr. Weiss is an art dealer, a director and sole shareholder of MWL. Yes, thank you. So that's, that's what Mark Weiss have to say about it. And then tab 16, you will find the re-re-amended defense of Fairlight, and the relevant paragraph is found on page 221 at paragraph 18, where you see that paragraph 2 of the re-re-amended particulars of claim uh, is accepted without qualification. Yeah. So, my lords, I'll come back to other passages that are relevant uh, when we look at the individual issues. Um, the only point I stress at this stage is that it has been common ground from the beginning of this dispute through to the end, that Fairlight was a non-trading vehicle used by Mr. Cowitz for occasional... Sorry, page 218, paragraph 3b. Uh, Fairlight says it is a trading entity, not a non-trading entity. Um, sorry, that is... I have missed that. I'm not sure then why. Paragraph 2 is... Um, sorry, paragraph 3, yeah, 3... Yes, that, um, my lady, I'm sorry, I've missed that. I'm not sure then why paragraph two of the particular claim is um, accepted without qualification. The two appear to be inconsistent. Was there any um, evidence as to whether or not Fairlight traded? It may be that the, the word trade is, 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 
is not important in the sense that what is common ground is that it was used by Mr. Cowitz to invest in art from time to time. So it's not said that it was in the business of buying and selling works of art. And not, not in business, but trading. I understand. These are all slightly slippery terms, aren't they? I mean, one person's they, investment can often be another person's trade, particularly in a field like old master pictures. Which oh, absolutely, which is why you need to look at the particular role. So, for example, yeah. um, buying and selling works of art for Mark Weiss Limited is undoubtedly a business. Yes. But if you or I buy a painting and subsequently sell it, it's unlikely to be classed as a business. It would be an investment or simply because you want something on the wall. Mm. But anyway, we'll come back to that because we'll look at it in more detail as to what's required uh, in order to establish a partnership when we're looking at that particular issue. Now, the, so that's the, the, the parties. So far as the contractual framework is concerned, there are five relevant agreements of which four are an issue on this appeal. The first is the agreement between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited, and the issue on this appeal is, was that a partnership or wasn't it? The second is the agreement by which Fairlight acquired the painting. There's no distinct issue in relation to that agreement. The third agreement is the agreement by which Fairlight authorized Mark Weiss Limited to sell the painting, um, and the issue that arises there, it, 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 very rough summary is, was it authority to sell, or was it, did it include authority to bind Fairlight to a contract with Sotheby's? The fourth agreement is the agreement between Mark Weiss Limited That's right, point, and... Point three is ground one, is it? Uh, well, it's... Ground one is, spans point, uh, agreement number three and agreement number four. It's agreement... Sorry, sorry to have interrupted you, but no. we start on ground one with agreement number three. Yes, and, and ground one also requires us to look at agreement number four, because the fourth agreement is the agreement between Mark Weiss Limited and Sotheby's. Uh, and the first issue in relation to that agreement is the one already identified. Was this an agreement with Mark Weiss Limited, or was it an, also an agreement with Fairlight, either uh, as a co-owner or because Mark Weiss Limited and Fairlight were in partnership? So was it an agreement with the firm? And the second issue in relation to this fourth agreement, which is referred to in a lot of the documents as Contract A, the second issue concerns the guarantee that Sotheby's was entitled to give to the buyer. Specifically, what is the effect of the agreement that the guarantee would only be applicable to the original buyer and not to any subsequent owner? That's ground four. And then the fifth relevant agreement is the agreement between Sotheby's and Nevada by which title was transferred to Nevada. That's the sale contract and it's referred to in a number of the documents as contract B. And, and the main issue in relation to that agreement concerns the GAV clause, the generally accepted views clause. And that's ground three of the appeal. So if we just uh, look at some of those in rather more detail. The first, I, I, I don't need to go through at this stage, the first being the agreement between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. As you will have seen from the documents, that a draft agreement was produced by the lawyers acting for Mr. Kowitz and Fairlight and was sent to Mark Weiss Limited. But I don't need to take you to that draft agreement now, certainly, because it wasn't signed. So clearly it obviously doesn't have the same status as a, as a signed agreement. The second agreement, that's the contract between Fairlight, or the agreement between Fairlight or Mr. Cowitz and Mark Weiss Limited. Sorry, that's, that's, uh, I've got that wrong. I'm muddling myself now. The second is the, the agreement by, by which Fairlight acquired the painting for itself and Mark Weiss Limited. Uh, I will just show you that. Um, we can put the core bundle to one side and take out the supplementary bundle, at tab one. Whilst we're doing that, Mr. Collins, at some stage, um, speaking entirely for myself, it would be very helpful. I have no feel for who gave oral evidence or how the eight days were filled. 
not now, but at a convenient moment, it would just be helpful for some clarification on that. Would that be most helpful if it's provided in a, essentially like a timetable, trial timetable? Yes, or, or, or who gave oral evidence? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Not, not now, but at a convenient moment. <coughs> What we would probably do then is provide that in written form and see if we can get it agreed yes. with the other side. That would be very helpful if it's an agreed note. For the <coughs> so if that's a matter on which I can't personally assist as I wasn't there. And we have some extracts from the um, transcripts in the, in, in the bundle, in the appeal bundle, but certainly are not enough to give an overall picture of who was doing what and when. So I, th I, I was moving on to the second agreement. Yes. Uh, and we we're getting out the <coughs> supplemental bundle tab one, and you find that at page 44. The, uh, I, I, I don't need to say much about this agreement, for the simple reason that there's not, there's not actually any argument about its terms. Um, you, you can see from, if you've got page 44 just under the head, heading purchase agreement, you can see the parties are identified. And so far as the buyer is concerned, the only party identified is Fairlight. But it's, it, it's common ground that Fairlight was buying for both itself and Mark Weiss Limited as co-owners. Now, Fairlight says that that's because it was simply buying on behalf of itself and Mark Weiss Limited. Sotheby says that it's because Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited were in a partnership. So this would be an acquisition by the firm of Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. Um, there's no reference anywhere in the document to Mark Weiss Limited. Um, but as I said, the fact that they were co-owners is common ground. Then, then the third agreement I referred to is the agreement between... Yeah, sorry, before you go on, that does illustrate the point, doesn't it? But quite often in this sort of area, anyway, one does find agreements in which a named party is actually in a very important relationship with an un unnamed party. And presumably yes. the contract in question is meant to bind both of them, one would think, even though only one of them is named. Well, it, the precisely how uh, would depend on the circumstances. Of course, yes. you, a legal owner can buy on behalf of itself, at, but hold a, another party can have a beneficial interest. Um, or you can have a firm where the, where the partnership acquires uh, an interest in an asset. Uh, and, and we say it's the former rather than the latter. Yes. But I would accept the, the general point. That you can't always simply look at the agreement, stop when you get to the end of the agreement, and say, that's the end of the inquiry. And quite often, for all sorts of reasons, people don't like to have their names blazoned all over the face of a document, although it's one they know perfectly well about and intend to be bound by. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's normal, it's, and you decide who's bound by it, by the application of the normal agency principles. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that's the, the second agreement. The, the third agreement um, is, is the agreement by which Mark Weiss Limited was given authority to actually sell on behalf of both of them. And the, in the judgment, the judge refers to an exchange of emails on the 17th of May, 2011. It's actually only one email that contains any relevant text, and that is in the same part, same tab of this bundle at page 66. And this is an email from Mr. Kowitz uh, to Mr. Weiss on the 17th of May, 2011, uh, and Mr. Kowitz is saying, this is to confirm that I am authorizing you to sell the house at a price at or above $12 million, as mentioned on the phone, I would like to be consulted on any decision to consign it to a third party before you make such a commitment. Now, the, the first point we make about this is this is giving Mark Weiss Limited authority to sell the painting. It's not, I give you authority to go and conclude a contract with Sotheby's. It's actually giving them authority to sell. So, for example, if somebody had come into the Mark Weiss Gallery the next day and offered $13 million, this would have allowed Mark Weiss Limited to sell the painting to that third party. Um, Mr. Collins, as you rightly say, there's references uh, in the papers to an exchange of emails. 
there was an exchange, but the only relevant one is this one, which is why it's the only one we've got. Yes, I did. I, I was provided with a copy of the trial bundle. I did hunt it down, and it really added added nothing at what, all. What, what Mr. Vice says, <coughs> buy or got it, or I can't there. even remember whether it preceded this or came after it. Right. But I looked at it and formed the view it didn't need to be added to the bundles. It really didn't add anything to what you see. This yeah. this is the email by which the authority is is given. Um, I'm afraid I can't recall precisely what the other one said, but it was some, something of that order. Um, so, and this is, I mean, this is an agreed bundle. I'm sure that if anyone thought the other email was relevant, then someone would have added it in. So, so the second point, first is it's an authority to sell. The second point is that it contemplated that Mark Weiss Limited might, for that purpose, consign the painting to a third party, such as Sotheby's, but asked that Fairlight be consulted by Mark Weiss Limited before it did so. Uh, and the third point, which is relevant given the eventual sale price, is that here, obviously, the, the price floor was $12 million. It's clear that further authority was required in order to sell the painting at a lower price. At least, at least on our analysis, further authority was required. If it was a partnership, then, of course, the partner could sell it and bind the partnership to a third party um, irrespective of any internal. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. In, yes. Well, we'll come, I'll come on to this in more detail. But yes, I mean, a, a, a par partners might agree amongst themselves that one partner's authority is limited. Yes. Hmm. Uh, but unless the third party actually knows of that limitation, then the partnership is bound by well, the assets of the partner. Hmm. Um, but it is. The, the, the partner would. The partner would not be able to. Um, would not have authority. Couldn't properly sell <coughs> below twelve million. As between themselves, but it could bind the yes. partnership. Oh, yes. To a, yes. But it will be a breach of contract as to breach of contract. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that, that's the point. And, and, and it's not, I mean, obviously, there are other situations in which that can happen where applying principles of ostensible authority, but here it's a statutory authority uh, conferred on the partners. But the, 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 the point I'm making is certainly as between themselves, and this is the point, maybe I shouldn't have qualified it because we've gone off on a bit of a sidetrack. The, the point is, as between themselves, clearly. Further authority was required before Mark Weiss Limited could sell the painting for less than 12 million. And to put that into context, the eventual sale price was 10.75 plus Sotheby's commission, which was paid by the buyer. So um, that's what, what's the, the relevance of that in the, in the trial as it, as it emerged. Um, I hadn't picked up that it was being suggested that um, there was some problem with it being sold for slightly less. Oh, or that there was some problem with your client receiving half of the proceeds? No, there's, there's certainly not suggested there was a problem. I, I've said that further authority was required. In fact, the and further you, authority was given. Was given. I see. So yes. why, why, yeah. so why, why are we um, going at, at well, this pace in that case? The, the reason why I've, I've, I've highlighted this, and it's other reason their skeleton make a point that this authority was not sufficient because uh, <coughs> it doesn't cover the eventual sale through Sotheby's because it says that it's only authority down to 12 million. And we'll look. I'll, I'll, I'll take you to the passages in the evidence that deal with the change from. Just so we in. so we know where we're going before we get there. Um, is, is, I hadn't understood that it was an issue in the case that um, everybody was in the end happy that it was sold through Sotheby's for the price that it was sold for. That's correct. Yeah. It, every uh, there was there was a discussion and an agreement uh, that it could be sold at that price. There's certainly no complaint about the price at which this painting was sold. So the issue is whether there was a direct contractual relationship. Fairlight and Sotheby's. Yes, yeah, I mean, and that is the issue. I'm mean, the reason I'm at the moment. I'm just looking at the contractual framework, so you can see this is the authority. The judge refers to in paragraph three, an exchange of emails. I'm just taking you to the the one email that is relevant to show what that actually said, and I accept that there then had to be some further discussion and agreement before it could be sold for less, which there was. So that's the third the third agreement. The fourth agreement I mentioned is the agreement with Sotheby's that's referred to as contract A. And that's in the same tab of the bundle, starting at page 75. Now, I, I, I don't want to work through this in, in detail now, because we're going to have to come back to it when we're arguing about particular clauses. Uh, I, I would just highlight a, a couple of points so you can see what this contract uh, was about. Um, you can see if. If you read, um, you see it's in the form of a letter addressed to Mark Weiss Limited. 
and then you have dear sirs, then the then the heading, and then below the heading it says this letter agreement, the agreement confirms the terms on which you grant to Sotheby's in London, Sotheby's, the exclusive right to offer and sell the property by private treaty to a prospective buyer identified by Sotheby's, prospective buyer, for a period of three months from the date you sign this agreement. So what we have here, this is an agreement that confers authority on Sotheby's to sell the painting to one of its clients. And then below that, you have various terms uh, set out, some of which we may need to come back to. Uh, on page 77, uh, you will see the signature page. On the left-hand side, it's signed by Sotheby's. On the right-hand side, you'll see the signature is that of Mark Weiss, and underneath his name, Mark Weiss, duly authorized for and on behalf of Mark Weiss Limited. So I mean, I make the perhaps obvious point, no mention there of Fairlight or of what is now said to be the partnership. Then over the page, uh, you have the private treaty terms that were referred to in the letter and attached to the letter. <coughs> Uh, and again, these we'll need to come back to because we're going to be arguing about one of these in particular um, <coughs> in the context of the right to rescind. It. So uh, in the context of ground four in particular. But I just um, highlight, which is, oh, well, identify the relevant clauses for now. On the private treaty terms, top left, you see under seller's warranties, there's you warrant to Sotheby's and to the buyer that at all relevant times, including but not limited to the time of the consignment of the property and the, date and the time of the sale, A, you are the true owner of the property or are properly authorized to sell the property by the true <coughs> owner. So what, what Sotheby's are seeking there, they're not saying you are authorized, you warrant you're authorized to conclude this contract with Sotheby's. All they're seeking is confirmation from the consignor that the consignor has authority to sell the painting, uh, which is perhaps relevant when we come to look at the privity issue. Um, so the other clause, just a flag at this stage, or maybe, maybe so you can highlight the relevant clause. In the right-hand column, uh, about an inch or so down, you see the heading guarantee. And then we don't need to look at the first paragraph for now. It's the second paragraph uh, that includes the right of rescission and the GAV clause which we will be coming to. So um, sorry, no, I, I made a mistake, no, sorry, no. sorry, my mistake, yeah, I've, I've made a mistake, sorry, we, this is the trouble of trying to go through things too quickly. Um, if you, actually, we, I will go through this, because I actually, I, I, I misspoke, uh, and my lady picked me up before I had a chance to correct myself. So this is in the, this is in the agreement by which Sotheby's are authorized uh, by Mark Weiss Limited to sell the painting. And this says, notwithstanding the general of the preceding paragraph, Sotheby's should guarantee to the buyer that the property is not counterfeit and imitation intended to deceive. The guarantee will not be assignable and will only be applicable to the original buyer, not to any subsequent owner or owners who acquire the interest in the property. In the event that Sotheby's determines the property is counterfeit, you agree to rescission of sale and will return to the buyer the purchase price received by you for the property, and the buyer will return the property to you. So yeah, actually, the first point to note here is that this, this agreement, does, the rescission provision does not state that the authenticity, authenticity guarantee is to include a GAV clause. Uh, and that's a point of distinction, in fact, between this contract A and contract B, which we, we, we will come on to. And the second point just to note is that the, in the event of the rescission, uh, it, is, it is the you, i.e. Mark Weiss Limited, that is required to refund the buyer. Then that's the fourth agreement. We move on now just to the fifth agreement, the agreement referred to as contract B. Uh, and that starts on page 85 of this bundle. <coughs> Be 85? Uh, I think the, well, it, in oh. fact, I've got it 59. It depends where you're taking it from. I mean, I was actually looking at it in the core bundle, 
which is where it's annexed to an earlier version of, I think, um, uh, right skeleton argument. But it's identical. Oh, sorry. I was, I was just working through tab one of the supplemental bundle. I mean, that, the that answer is we can look at it in either place, but it doesn't mean right. the pages are different. The, the advantage of the supplemental bundle is you actually have all of the, yes. all of the agreements in one tab. That. Um, so whichever page uh, you're using, um, you can see that this is, this is in a similar form to Contract A in the sense that it's a letter from Sotheby's, this time addressed to Nevada. Well, it's broad in there, is it? Um, but uh, as you say, it adds the gap. Yeah, right. well, well, in fact, a lot of, uh, I say it's similar in form in that it's the form of a letter. The actual terms, if you work through them, are, are not the same. No, it, it's but, different. But the guarantee, yeah. the clause for. Yes, there are certain similarities, but also the, the point is, if we just look at the, the first paragraph under the heading, uh, it says, this letter agreement confirms the terms under which the, the seller and Sotheby's in London as seller's agent will sell the property to you, subject in all respects to receipt by Sotheby's of a license and licenses. So, so what, what we, you see here is that this is an agreement I mean, Sotheby's undertakes some personal obligation as well, but it's an agreement between, principally, Nevada and Sotheby's as the seller's agent. And, and my lady, you are right, it's clause four of this agreement that governs rescission in the event that the painting is determined by Sotheby's to be a counterfeit. And it's in this clause uh, that you find the GAV clause. Um, so, my lord, my lady, that, that those are the five agreements that provide the contractual framework for the issues that we are arguing about today and tomorrow. Then if we move on briefly just to look at the dispute, um, we can put away the supplemental bundle for now and just look at the core bundle where you find the judgment. The judgment is in the core bundle at tab five, starting at page 66, well the heading's on 66 and the text on page 67. Uh, and, and, and the um, <coughs> dispute is summarized, if I just take you to a, to a couple of paragraphs you can see what is said to be common ground and what is said to be in dispute. Paragraph seven uh, identifies the common ground, and my Lord's Lady, I see no, no benefit in me reading that out, um, as I'm sure that you've read that already, and, and indeed we've covered some of the agreements referred to already. There's then, uh, after that, uh, extensive citation of the clauses of the contract, and you'll see that for the next uh, few pages. And then the when we get to page 74, uh, this is where the dispute is identified. And in particular, paragraph 16, uh, the judge identifies the arguments being made by Fairlight. And if we're looking through those, it's subparagraphs 1, 2, 5, and 6 are the points that are still uh, live. Uh, in this appeal. And so those are the points um, one finds that in the, the grounds of appeal and also the, the order granting permission, which uh, lists the four points in respect of which permission was given. And then in the respondent's notice, there is an additional point that is raised uh, in relation to the GAV clause and one finds the respondent's notice in tab 11 of the core bundle. And it's on page 134 at the bottom of the page that this additional point is raised. And was this point raised below? Yes, it was. So the, the point is made that it said that the judge was right to conclude that there was not a generally accepted view of scholars and experts. However, even if the conclusions were wrong, it would not have affected the judge's decision because the proviso in contract B did not qualify Sotheby's right under contract A to require the sellers to return the purchase price when the 
painting which mm. determined to be counterfeit. Uh, and because of um, the judge's finding, uh, he didn't need to deal with this point? Yes, so the point was argued, but he didn't decide it. Thank you. So we can see from this that the, uh, in the issues fall broadly into two categories. The first category is the privity issues. Essentially, was there privity of contract between Sotheby's and Fairlight, whether as a co-owner or as a partner in a firm? And then secondly, there's the rescission issues. Essentially, was Sotheby's entitled to rescind and recover the purchase price from whoever was party to contract A? So if I start with the privity issues. Now, in the grounds of appeal and the skeletons, the sub-agency point is addressed first and the partnership point second. But in my oral submissions, I, I plan to reverse this because I, it, it makes rather more sense, in my view, to first consider the question of who is the seller or, or who are the sellers before then going on to consider whether by signing contract A, Mark Weiss created privity of contract, not just between Sotheby's and Mark Weiss Limited, but also between Sotheby's and Fairlight, whether as co-owner co -owner or as partner. So, so I plan to take, sort of reverse the order and deal with partnership first. Just, um, obviously we'll approach it in your, your own way, but um, how was it argued at trial? Was it argued from the, um, the way that it appears in the judgment? The, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure that there's any um, particular significance. I mean, I'm changing the order because it strikes me as more logical. Yes, but, so, but, but just so we, we can put the put submissions in the context of what the judge was dealing with. In, mm. it, it, on reading the judgment, it looks as if he was dealing with privacy, and then he, he mm. reached a conclusion about that, and so didn't go on to say very much about partnership. Yes. Um, whereas your, your, as it were, um, approaches might be said to be different. Um, uh, in I, fact, I, although it may be the same thing analytically. So it, it appears from the documents that I've looked at that, that the privity, but the sub agency privity point was, was put first and was first and foremost. Partly because the partnership point was actually wasn't in the original pleading. That was a point that. that, that uh, was it the re amendment or the re re amendment? Yes, I, I, th I think the re rather than the re re, but um, I, I'd have to check that. So, so the, the partnership point appeared uh, from recollection not very late in the day, but when the when the um, case was already quite well progressed. It was after Mr. Kovitz had produced his first witness statement referring to partnership or partners. Or, or Mr. Weiss, Mr. Weiss had produced a witness statement referring to partners. And, and Mr. Kovitz as well. He, well, what's relied on, well, Mr. Kovitz didn't deal with the partnership issue in his, in his first yeah. statement because it wasn't then live. Mm -hmm. And he then did a, a <coughs> second statement, or there was a subsequent statement addressing, addressing that. So, um, I just, I'm sorry, I, because you're, you're about to enter into the important part of the appeal, or at least one of the important parts of the appeal, I'm just trying to um, situate um, your uh, preference, which I quite understand at a level of um, legal analysis for saying, let's look at partnership first and then look at privacy. Um, but um, when one's thinking about it uh, and trying then to analyze it. It seems as if you're directing your fire on a different target uh, to the target that um, your trial predecessor was um, concerned about in the first instance. Yeah. Well, I, th I think I will still direct my fire at the same point. I, 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 I would accept that at trial, as far as we can tell, it appears to have been um, assume no partnership was their privity. Yes. Then fall back because probably as, historically yeah. a partnership was late to the table. Yeah. Then, then a sort of fall back argument. Well, even if, if even if there isn't, there's a partnership. Does that make a difference? <coughs> Obviously, privity issues still arise if there's a partnership. So you still have to show that the partnership is privy to the contract with Sotheby's, not just an individual that's who is a partner. Well, that's your that's your as it were fall back on partnership. You see, even if there was a partnership, then entering into the agreement with Sotheby's without trying it. That was a point, as I understand, it not argued in there. Well, it, there, there's certainly the, the point that there was no privilege between the partnership was, as I think, argued and is addressed by the judge, but he addresses it in one paragraph, which we'll come to look, look at. 
What I plan to do though is I'll address partnership because, it, as I said, it's logical to look at who is actually the seller before you then look at privity. But I accept that when we come to privity, I have to, I have to look at it almost with two different, on the basis of two different hypotheses. Hypothesis one, no partnership, and that's exactly the point that is addressed. That's ground one. Then hypothesis two will be, yes, there is a partnership. Okay, what difference yep. does it make? <coughs> so, <clears throat> what I like to do in partnership is. Uh, for the next sort of hour or so, is first look at the law of partnership insofar as relevant to this dispute. Then look at the judgment. And then what I'm going to need to do is actually work through the paragraphs of the judgment. And, and whilst doing that, I will take you to the relevant parts of the evidence so we can see what the judge was referring to and what he failed to refer to. <clears throat> and then what I would do at the end is, is draw together, the, look at the three essential ingredients of partnership and draw them together to hopefully persuade you that the correct conclusion is that there was no partnership. So, well, so as far as the, the law is concerned, we could probably put away the um, core bundle now and, and take out uh, the authorities bundle. My, my authorities bundle is split into two, and it's the second, with the, uh, the cases being in the, oh, I see. Okay. in the first bundle and the statutory and, and academic material in the second bundle. If we start with the second second bundle, bundle two at tab twelve, um, you will find there the Partnership Act, and the starting point, the important point, is found in section one, subsection one, which defines partnership. Partnership is the relation which subsists between persons carrying on a business in common with a view to profit. So you can see from there that there are three uh, requirements. First, the persons must be carrying on a business, that's the first requirement. Secondly, they must be doing so in common. And the third requirement is that they must be doing so with a view to profit. Now, uh, if there is a dispute as to whether or not a partnership exists, a judge can't properly determine that dispute without considering each of those three elements, as they each need to be established in order to conclude that a partnership exists. That's section one. In section two of the Act, what you find uh, are various rules that are designed to help uh, the parties in the court determine whether or not a partnership exists. And those are set out in section two, which provides in determining whether a partnership does or does not exist, regard shall be had to the following rules. And, and the first is, is important here, as are second and third. The, the joint tenancy, tenancy in common, joint property, common property, or part ownership does not itself create a partnership as to anything so held or owned, whether the tenants or owners do or do not share any profits made by the use thereof. Um, my lord, my lady, we say that's clearly relevant to the present case, and indeed it was referred to by the judge in the ju judgment, which we will come on to. <coughs> then rule 2.2 two is to similar effect. It says the sharing of gross returns does not itself create a partnership, whether the persons sharing such returns have or have not a joint or common right or interest in any property from which or from the use of which the returns are derived. So, that's to similar effect, but it makes clear that sharing of gross returns from jointly owned property, like sharing of profits, does not itself create a partnership. Then if we move on to rule 2.3, um, th this, this is significant. So it helps to establish where the line is drawn between partnership and not partnership in cases where there, there because, sorry, if I rewind a little bit, of course, joint ownership of property does not itself create a partnership, but it might be one of, the, I would accept it might be one of the factors that a court relies on in order to conclude that there was a <coughs> partnership. And, and subparagraph three helps, further helps identify where the line is drawn between partnership and not partnership. It says the receipt of a person of a share of profits of a business is prima facie evidence that he is a partner in the business, but the receipt of a sh such a share or a payment contingent on a very contingent on or varying with the profits of a business 
does not of itself make him a partner in the business. And in particular, and then they go on to give a couple of examples, which I will look at. Actually, we'll go straight on to those. A, the receipt of a person by a person of a debt or other liquidated amount by installments or otherwise out of the accruing profits of the business does not of itself make him a partner in the business or liable as such. A contract for the remuneration of a servant or agent of a person engaged in the business by a share of the profits of the business does not of itself make the servant or agent a partner in the business or liable as such. So the first point uh, I, I want to focus on here is obviously the, what you see is a difference between rules one and two and, and, the, and the part of rule three that we've been looking at is the use of the word business. So rules one and two talk, anticipate joint owners sharing profits, but there's no use of the word business. And then rule three is actually looking at the sharing of the profits of a business. Um, and we say that that's one of the crucial questions you need to ask when, look, when applying these rules. On one side of the line, you have persons who jointly acquire prop property and profit from it. On the other side, you have persons who share the profits of a <coughs> business. Now, that business might, of course, involve buying and selling property. Um, but, but it's not enough just to say, well, they bought it jointly, they sold it, they made a profit. But in your case, is the fact that there was a relationship between um, your client and MWL, um, and that from time to time they bought, acquired, sold paintings, mm. um, has to be assessed for whether that's a business or, or not. Yes. And, 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 and the other point I want to draw out of this, it, 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 so one is business, and also it's a business in common. Because what you see, the example in 3B three, three anticipates you might have two people working together and sharing the profits. But if one is master and the other is servant, they're not in partnership. So even if, if um, say, I don't know, a bricklayer employs someone and says you can have 50% of the profits of the business as your pay, that doesn't make them partners if one is master and the other is servant. And we would say the same is here. The same, the same true here. We have an art dealer and a client. They, they might jointly buy some works of art, or the client might help the art dealer fund certain acquisitions. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are in business in common. The art dealer is an art dealer, and the client's a client. Uh, 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 Mr. Collins, section two, subsection three, um, provides for uh, a situation where there is it's prima facie evidence. So mm. it's, it's up to the ante from one and two. Yes. One and two is simply doesn't of itself create. Mm. But if you're in the business model, yep. then that is prima facie evidence. It doesn't mean you have to, that you can't have a partnership in the absence of a business. You can't have, you're not suggesting you can't have a statutory partnership in the absence of a business, or are you? Yes, I, yes, I am. Because if you look at the definition... No, with a view to profit. Well, no, no. They, they carrying on a business, I see. Yes. Carrying, so I said, so you say there has to be a business. There has to be a business, yes. I think. That yes. Is, that yes. Is, that yes. Is. yes, so, yes so, me, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, and, and, and this, I mean, I'll, co I'll come back to this. I know I'm skipping over it quite quickly. I mean, we do say, and I'll say again, that there are three requirements. Yes, no, I understand. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But you're, I mean, your short point is that, that to be a, an art dealer and to have a client and to periodically enter into... Um, agreements whereby you're going to mutually profit from art dealing mm. and so forth. It may or may not be a business, but, but on the facts of this case it wasn't. Well, I, I would say the starting point that it wouldn't be a business because you're looking at a dealer and a client rather than... Yes, well, it, but well I, I, it may or may not, surely. I mean, if it happens yes. with sufficient regularity um, mm. that when one looks at it and steps back one says, well, they're, they're, they're in business together, yeah. in a business. Yes. And you can have a business in relation to a single asset. Or not. I mean, it's possible to have a partnership formed for the exploitation of an opportunity to purchase and exploit um, one a single business opportunity. Yes, that, that would be possible. I mean, one could form a partnership in principle for the acquisition and onward disposal of at a profit of one old master painting. It's not conceptually impossible. It's, it's not, conceptually, it. not conceptually impossible. Um, for example, if you had two dealers, neither of them could afford the painting themselves. They, they decided to form a partnership. Or, or two people from exactly. completely outside yeah. the art world, mm. for example, who, who, yes. who, who you know, they may be interested in business people in a completely different <coughs> context who decided to make a killing on a particular object. 
But then you also have to look, for example, in the, the, the art, two art dealer example, are they actually going into partnership? So are they going into business in common? Or are they simply just jointly buying this work of art and selling it, each as part of their own business? Because there's no reason why Mark Weiss Limited couldn't buy a 50% share of painting uh, and then sell it as part of Mark Weiss Limited's business. And the other 50% owner might be another dealer who does it as part of their business. <coughs> They've got to actually be in business in common. That's the second requirement in order to give rise to a partnership. <coughs> and that's the point that's perhaps emphasized by the example in 3B. That two people can be working in the same business, but, but if, their, if their roles are different, then there may not be a partnership. <coughs> So, um, then moving on, that's, I, th I think those are the only rules that are relevant in, in section two. Um, moving on, um, the point we touched on earlier, section five, uh, you find the, the power of a partner to bind a firm. Yeah. Um, there's nothing controversial about this, uh, but, but it is relevant because it emphasizes the importance of establishing precisely what constitutes the business of the firm. Because it's only if you can identify and define the business that you can establish the authority of each partner to conduct that business. So in this instance, for example, you say, well, was, if, if, if you assume there was a business, was the business limited to this one painting, or was it an ongoing business? Um, it's also important, with the point I made earlier, that if Fairlight and MWL were in part... Me, and the um, uh, MWL's position and Sotheby's position was that it was a partnership just for this painting, a business just for this painting. Well, yes, that's certainly... They've not pleaded anything wider, but... the. But then when you look at what the, the judge's approach, he refers to previous dealings. And it's wholly unclear what the business is actually said to be. Um, so that's, that's section, section five. And over uh, the page on section six, to, to similar effect, uh, you have the that partners are bound by acts on behalf of the firm. Again, there's nothing controversial or, or difficult about that. Um, the important point is that the firm is only bound if the person concluding the contract intended to bind the firm. So, of course, a partner might do things. <laughs> the fact that somebody's a partner in the firm doesn't mean that everything they do is on behalf of the firm. And that's likely to be particularly important in a case such as this, where one of the partners, MWL, does in fact have its own business. It is, it is an art dealer. So the next provision I want to look at, uh, we can go forwards a bit, is to section 20 of, of the Act. Uh, partnership property. Section 20, subsection 1 says that all property and rights and interests in property originally brought into the partnership stock or acquired, whether by purchase or otherwise on account of the firm, or for the purposes and in the course of the partnership business, are called in this act partnership property, and must be held and applied by the partners exclusively for the purposes of the partnership in accordance with the partnership agreement. So th there's nothing really controversial or difficult about this. The point is that if there's a statutory partnership, then partnership property can only be used for the purposes of the firm. The partners can't, they can't say, well, I've got a 50% interest in that property, so I'm going to use that 50% interest to, for example, secure a loan. Because it's partnership property, and it can only be used to secure partnership loans. So the, the next relevant provisions, if we move on, Nine uh, and thirty. Twenty-nine one. Um, 
this, now we're just looking at an incidence of partnership, but, but it is important to look at the incidence of partnership when seeking to determine whether or not a partnership has come into existence. Paragraph 29.1 says, every partner must account to the firm for any benefit derived by him without the consent of the other partners from any transaction concerning the partnership or from any use by him of the partnership property, name, or business connection. And then 30, there's the duty of the partner not to compete with the firm. Now, we say these considerations are particularly important in a case such as the present where one of the alleged partners does in fact carry on its own business. Now, if that party is deemed to have entered into a partnership in order to carry on a business in the same field, uh, it's vital that the scope of the partnership business be properly understood and defined. Because if it's not, there's an obvious risk that the person, um, the personal business and the partnership business could be deemed to be in competition. So <clears throat> now, of course, I mean, if you have a, somebody who is a lawyer and joins a law firm, and they, the, the only way they practice law is through the law firm, there's no difficulty. But here the difficulty is Mark Weiss Limited trades old masters. If it's going to be found to have entered into a partnership with Fairlight, it's important that the scope of that partnership is properly understood. Because otherwise, what happens when, when there's an opportunity to buy a work of art? Can Mark Weiss Limited take that work of art into its own stock, or does it have to offer it to the partnership? And also, when um, in relation to the house, can Mark Weiss Limited use the house, display it in its gallery in order to promote its own business? Well, no, if it's a partnership asset, it can only use it to promote the partnership. So that's why these points are, are, are important and sensitive when you have one of the parties who is actually in business in the relevant field, but is said to have entered into a partnership in the same field. I mean, there's another way of putting this point to say that partners are in a fiduciary relationship as between each other, with all, therefore, the usual incidents of a fiduciary relationship, such as the obligation to account for secret profits and so on and so forth. Uh, absolutely. I mean, they, they are in a fiduciary relationship, and this is really just a statutory codification exactly. of some of those yeah. fiduciary duties. I'm just looking at the open skeleton of uh, your client at trial. Um, were these sections uh, emphasised, or were the sections made to the judge along the lines that you're now advancing? Uh, in the materials I have seen, I have not seen certainly. A, a uh, the same sort of structured review of the, the, of act, the act that I hope that I yeah. Everybody seems to have both um, in your client's mm -hmm. opening skeleton and closing skeleton to have. Uh, yes. The, the focus uh, from recollection was largely on sections one and two of the act. Mm -hmm. Yes. The so one that defines the partnership act and two setting out some of, the, some of the rules to help you ascertain whether or not there is one. I mean, these are generally well-known provisions. They are, yeah. they are, yes. I'm not, um, uh, and I hope I'm not laboring, laboring the point too much. The, but it, but I, I, I'm going through them just because a finding of partnership mm. is very significant. It's not, something, it's not a decision going to be sort of lightly made. No, no, I, I um, understand why you're taking us mm. to them. But I mean, I equally, it's probably fair to say that a judge of the commercial court would be expected to know about the key provisions of the Partnership yeah. Act without having necessarily having them spelled out to him. Correct. Well, and, and even if unaware that some of these duties were codified in the Act, would be aware of the, the basic principle that mm. partners owe each other fiduciary duties. Yes. Mm. Then the final section I'd like you to look at briefly is section 45, um, where you see a definition of uh, business. It says the expression business includes every trade, occupation, or profession. Now, I accept that, that definition is, in, is inclusive rather than exclusive. So, so it, it doesn't exclude the possibility that something else could constitute a business. But we say, nonetheless, it does give a clear steer as to what will or will not be regarded as a business for the purposes of the Act. They could simply have said any activity carried out for profit. But of course, we, we know 
That's not what it means, for two reasons. One, because with a view to profit is actually a separate requirement. There's business in common and with a view to profit. So we know that a view to profit isn't enough to make it a business. And secondly, if, if that had been what was intended, that could have been spelt out here rather than identifying trade, occupation, or profession. What, what those tell you is pointing to activity that is commercial and which is carried out essentially as a sort of job or employment of some description. Now, some activities will obviously constitute a business. But the practice of law uh, for reward is a good example. Um, other activities will not uh, necessarily or will not constitute a business even if they are carried out with a view to profit. So for example, if my siblings and I jointly invest in a property, um, which is, but there's no business, we just decided we want to invest in some property, then it, because it's not our trade, occupation, or profession, that suggests that it's not a business. And then also you go back, this brings you full circle, really back to rule 2-1, which says that actually joint ownership of property isn't doesn't constitute a partnership, even if you share the profits. Um, I mean, these distinctions give rise famously to very fine distinctions. I mean, for example, in a tax deal, which is what I happen to know a bit about, you get all sorts of contested cases as to what has to be done in order to make something into a, a business or an adventure in the nature of trade and so on and so forth. Yes. Um, which is not to say, I mean, the principles are there, but their application to a given set of facts can often be very difficult. And for example, if you and your siblings buy the property and then begin engaging in a buy to death operation, then you may well be entering into a field where you could be partners without knowing it, unless you're careful. Yes, and, and if, we, if we gave up our day jobs and devoted our time well, entirely to, a euro, yes. then to, to, to buying, developing, and, and selling property, then, then the position would be very different. Hmm. But equally, the case law is clear, at least in the tax area, that you can have a, a business in the nature of a trade in relation to a single opportunity. Hmm. Uh, a single asset can be bought and sold for a profit in the circumstances the right that can amount to a, can amount to a trade which may not be the same as saying it's a partnership but yeah. all these questions overlap yeah and, 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 and if I pick up on one of the points your lordship's just made now of course, you, you're right there are numerous cases in this context and others that have grappled with the question of whether or not there's a business or whether or not there's a partnership and the word business is usually very broadly mm. understood and defined, at least in contexts I can think of. Yes. Although they're here, because they're, you're, you're right, I mean, it, it's sensitive to context. And here we have a, a definition of business in the Act, which we say clearly points you towards it being some kind of em employment or job. Because it's something by way of trade, occupation, or, or profession. So you can ask, well, is it that person's trade? Is it their profession? Is it their occupation? But the fact it's an inclusive definition, of course, leaves open a, 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 the possibility of a wider, a wider scope. It, it leaves open the possibility of a wider scope. And, and that's what I said. I'm saying it's not, I, I, I hope I made the point clear, I'm not saying it's exclusive, it's inclusive. But it gives you a clear steer as to what is intended by the word business in the context of the Act. Now, um, and there are, of course, previous cases, a number of previous cases that have grappled with the question of whether or not there's a partnership. But this is a field, in fact, where past authority generally provides very little by way of assistance. Um, because the law is actually set out in the Act. It identifies the three requirements. It gives you some rules to help you uh, ascertain whether or not there's a partnership. And then it sets out the incidents of the partnership. And the facts are generally particular to each individual case. But, but what I would like to do, though, I'll just show you one um, passage from Lindy and Banks, which perhaps illustrates the sort of problems that you're, you're, you're grappling with. But, I, but it's, not, it's not binding, although it refers to authority. They're not binding in, 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 even if they were Court of Appeal or, or, or higher, because they each is simply just an application mm. of the law as set out in the, act, in the Act to the specific fact situation. And the relevant passage is in tab 16 of, of this bundle. Uh, under the heading co-ownership. Um, and because, of course, co-ownership does give rise to particular problems or particular 
consideration because it can be the beginning, <coughs> the step one towards finding that there's a partnership, but the rules make it clear that co-ownership itself is not sufficient. So here the authors refer to section two of the Act. They say a partnership will not necessarily subsist between co-owners of property, whatever the manner of their acquisition, unless that was their original intention. And then they give an illustrative example of Fisher and Sons. Uh, and then it refers to a more recent illustration is Pratt and Medwin, where the original two parties, Messrs. Pratt and Medwin, had over a period acquired three properties for renovation and use in their insurance broking business and or for letting. Mr. Medwin subsequently transferred his share in one property to his son. Just, just pausing there, obviously if you couldn't transfer a share to his son, or at least couldn't lawfully transfer a share to his son if it was a partnership, because if it was a partnership, it was partnership property. Uh, but he could if they were just co-owners. Then it was held no partnership existed, and this issue was not pursued on the appeal. On the other hand, if premises are purchased by invested in co-owners who subsequently carry on business from those premises, there may be a partnership in the business, even if there is none in the premises. Um, and then I, I don't think we need to look at the next paragraph. All, all you see there is, is, is sort of a compare and contrast of co-ownership and, and partnership. Um, now, um, we, so we said that passage, I think, helpfully illustrates um, what may be a distinction between investment. If you, I mean, you're, you're investing for profit, because here they're looking to, um, to either well, use it in the business or let the properties out, and the carrying out of a business. It demonstrates the fact that even if property is used in a partnership business, it's not it doesn't necessarily mean that it is partnership property or that the co-owners of the property um, uh, are, are partners as regards that property. Now, we accept, obviously, that an agreement to jointly buy and sell pro for profit can constitute a partnership. So, um, for example, if two individuals agree to go into the business of jointly buying and selling cargoes of oil, and sharing the profits, then a partnership will likely be established from the moment that the business is established. But the crucial question, whenever you're looking at co-ownership with a view to profit, the crucial questions is, are, again, back to these three points, are they in business? If so, is it a business in common? If so, is it with a view to profit? What I was looking at is, in the end, the relation. Yes, as it says, and so presumably one has to look at the, the course of dealings um, involving the participants. Um, that although, as my lord says, one may, it's not impossible that one would have a partnership in relation to a single transaction. Um, the colour of an individual transaction is to be considered, is it not, in the context of other transactions of uh, a, a similar kind between the same parties? Yes. I mean, so in the case of a single transaction, you would probably have a particular focus on what was actually agreed when they, because you've only got one transaction to go on. But if you have a course of transactions, you might say, well, we don't, we don't really need to look at what they actually said to each other, because we can see that they've bought and sold jointly 20 paintings or, or 20 cargoes of oil. And in fact, they're both heavily engaged in this and, 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 and they, have a, they have a gallery or whatever. You, they jointly have a gallery. You, you could look at the, the course of dealing to establish. I mean, it's a matter of interest. I, I was just looking at Mr. Mr. Coates's statements mm. um, in, in this context. I, I can't remember. Was there any um, concluded picture of trial as to how many transactions they actually carried out on this model? Well, on this model, uh, my understanding is just one, because the previous model was rather different. The previous model was. Mr. Kovitz providing financing yes. to Mark Weiss Limited, whereas it, it, on, or, or Mr. Kovitz being the sole owner of the painting, but giving Mark Weiss Limited a sort of profit share in the event he made any profit. The, the difference here is they're actually co-owners. But the first time? I, I will ask somebody to check that. That's my understanding, based on an email where Mr. Mr. Weiss says, but you know, this time it's different. What, 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 why? Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Weiss thought this is the best picture mm. I've ever had. Um, yes. As it were. Well, 
But when he's discussing terms with Mr. Kovitz, and Mr. Kovitz is saying, well, I'll buy, I might be able to buy out at this price. And, and Mr. Weiss's response is, well, no, but this is different. What am, this time, I'm a 50% owner. So, Previously, so, it was Mr. Kovitz's money and Mr. Weiss's know-how and contacts mm. um, were, were, was the model. Yes. Well, in a way, the same is true here, because although um, Mark Weiss Limited is a 50% is a owner, Mr. Kovitz, personally, not Fairlight, Mr. Kovitz actually had to advance him a loan in order to enable him to buy his 50% share. Um, but but uh, uh, my understanding, and I'll, 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 I'll check this um, to make sure I don't get this wrong, my understanding is that this was the first transaction of this sort. So there was, there was a history, mm. to put it neutrally, but th this may not be exactly the representative of previous parts mm. of the history. That, that, that's my understanding. So uh, uh, the, the, last, the last point uh, I want to make, as so far as the law is concerned, is um, in relation to, to language. And I don't think this is uh, controversial. We've cited two authorities in our skeleton and produced one in the, in the bundle. And that's Protector Coat and Firth Glow. That's in the first authorities bundle um, at tab eight. So in the paragraph in your skeleton, I, I do remember the paragraph. Um, It's in uh, paragraph uh, 28, 7D on page 115 using the bundle number. So the, it's in authorities bundle at tab 8. And the relevant passage using internal page numbering page 17. And rather than me reading this out loud, if I could just ask you perhaps to read paragraph 16. That's substance, not label. That's your point. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's, so what was clear is I'm mean, language in the face of our, our evidence, language is not going to be conclusive. But, but, I, but I, I do suggest that language, even though not conclusive in the face of evidence pointing to the opposite conclusion, can still constitute evidence of what was agreed. So, so I'm aware a relationship uh, is clearly a statutory partnership, or clearly isn't. It doesn't matter what the parties call it. But there may be cases where the, the considerations are more finely balanced. And there, if the parties use the word partner or don't use the word partner, that may help the court determine what their actual intention was. Were they intending to go into business together in common? Your, your case must be that this plainly wasn't a partnership, following that through. Well, uh, I say it plainly wasn't, but actually I, that, doesn't, that doesn't need to be my case. <coughs> because I, when you look at the language, um, I'm going to make four, four suggestions. What we say is the correct approach. There's not all language is the same. Uh, language, no, but I, I, I jumped in to observe that the word partners was used um, well, in this case. And so I, it would seem to follow from what you've just said that you must therefore be aiming to show that this was a case in which that doesn't really matter. Well, we actually have a draft agreement that says not a partnership. And then we have an email which says use the words partners and some of the evidence where a witness uses the word partner. Yeah. Um, and so this is what I, uh, what I was going to say in relation to, to language and, and the weight that's to be attached to it is, is four points. First, this, so the, the, yeah, these four points go to the weight to be attached to the language. First, uh, the weight attached will be sensitive to context. Um, so in a case that admits either conclusion, in particular if the considerations are finely balanced between the partnership or no partnership um, conclusion, the language will carry more weight than where than another case where, for example, most of the evidence is pointing in one direction. Um, secondly, we say co-ownership it, it is an example of, of a case where the language might might we say put it no higher than that carry more weight because co-ownership, although it doesn't itself give to partnership, can combine when combined with other considerations, 
lead to a conclusion that there's a partnership. The co-ownership may be one of those cases where the considerations are more finely balanced. Um, thirdly, we say language is likely to, be, to carry more weight if it's consistent with other matters that indicate that a business is or is not being carried on out in, in common. For, for example... Sorry, did you just repeat that? Language right. may carry more weight if... if... If it is consistent with other matters that indicate that a business either is or is not being carried out in common. So if, 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 if a party acts in a way that's consistent with that and says, consistent with the finding that, that it is a business in common and, and uses the word partner, it, it's more likely to be given weight than if the actions and the words are inconsistent. And so, and, and fourthly, this is the fourth point, I'd say for, formal language that expressly addresses the issue of whether or not there is a partnership should carry more weight than informal use of the word partner in discussions or emails. Uh, and that's because individuals drafting documents particular of their lawyers, if they might expressly turn their mind and say, well, is there a statutory partnership or isn't there? And if they do expressly address that question, they can be expected to have actually thought about it and thought about the consequences and thought about what they actually want to do before they set out in writing uh, what the intention is. Conversely, in everyday language, people often use the word partner. They don't mean statutory partnership. It's used in all sorts of contexts. To mean all sorts of different things. It's, a, it's an objective test in the end. It's not, not a test of what people thought they were doing, it's what people were doing. Oh, absolutely. It's, a, it's an objective test. And, um, and at the moment, I'm, and I, I'm certainly not meaning to, say, to, to, to go back on what I've already said, which is that you can't create a partnership just by saying it's a partnership, and you can't prevent a partnership just by saying it isn't. What I'm saying is, in, in those cases that are finely balanced, where what the parties say might actually give you. Um, some indication of what they agreed. I, did they agree to go in business in common, or were they actually just two separate people looking after their own, own interests entering into a joint venture? For example, a joint venture is perhaps a good example. Uh, that's uh, two or more persons combining to conduct a business, but falls short of a, of a partnership. So if the actual question of partnership is being specifically addressed, then I would suggest you give more weight to the words than simply someone saying, oh, my partner this or my partner that in an email or a discussion. Because in the latter case, it's unlikely that they've actually thought about statutory partnership, and it's unlikely that they mean statutory partnership when they simply say partner. So what else? with that summary of the law, I'd like to turn uh, now to the judgment. So the, the authorities bundle can be put away on the court bundle. And just in, in case it helps, um, Mr. Collins, I've reminded myself of what, how the partnership was pleaded. So um, MWL's position was that it was to be inferred as a matter of fact and law that in agreeing to the purchase of the property, MWL and Fairlight agreed between themselves to carry on the business of purchasing and dealing with the property in common with a view to profit as partners in that business. So it was property, it was painting specific. Yes. The, 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 yeah, yeah the, the pleaded partnership was, and I was going to come, come on to that with the pleading, but I'm, I'm grateful. The point I made earlier was that when you look at the judgment, it's not, not clear what, what he's saying was the partnership, because he refers to previous dealings. But anyway, we'll, we'll come to that now. The judgment is... Could you, could you on that point just um, inform me, because I, I mm. don't know. Um, MWL was saying there was a partnership. Yes. What was Sotheby's saying? They effectively piggy. So is M MWL raise it first, and yes. then Sotheby's piggy jump piggyback on. on it, jump on it, and of course now Sotheby's are running it. Yes. yes. Uh, but in terms of ple original pleading, and also in terms of evidence, they were reliant on MWL because Sotheby's themselves uh, w wouldn't know. Um, so then the judgment is in. Uh, core bundle at tab five, uh, and the relevant section addressing partnership starts at paragraph 26. And it's a fairly, it's, it starts at 26, goes over to 36 on the next page. Um, 
as we shall see, in, in this section, the, the judge made no attempt to actually grapple with the three requirements of partnership. Uh, and I, I should say that sort of on, on the skeleton arguments and the, the other written documents before him, there, there, were, there was agreement as to what these three requirements are. If you look at some of these skeleton arguments, you see they also set out business income and profit. You could hardly fail to agree on something which is section one of the 1890 Act. Well, I, I, you, you <laughs> say that, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we've probably seen disagreements that we wouldn't expect to see in other yeah. cases. But, um, but so, so the three requirements were spelt out clearly, but there's no attempt to actually grapple with them in the judgment. He doesn't attempt to identify or define business. Indeed, the word business doesn't appear anywhere other than in paragraph 26, where he is quoting uh, from uh, a, a document put in by Fairlight. The, 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 um, the characterization in paragraph 26, as it were, as, uh, as if there was a dichotomy between a partnership on one hand and a, a, a wholly independent business on the other hand, is not a complete dichotomy, as you would expect. Yeah. But, but what he needed to do uh, is actually go through these three requirements. Say, was there a business, wasn't there? Yes or no. Then, was it, a bit, was it in common? Yes or no. Was it with a view to profit? And you see, there's no, there's no attempt in, in, in these 10 paragraphs to do that. I've dealt with business. And then, nor does he grapple with the question of whether or not the business was being carried on in common. And that's obviously important in this case, because Mark Weiss has its own art dealing business. And then in relation to the third requirement, the view to profit, now he does refer to profit sharing, but he fails to deal, or at least properly deal, with the point that sale for profit was only one of the options being considered by Fairlight when the painting was acquired. And I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll develop that shortly. So, in those why, why is that relevant? To the, that's when they acquired it. Why yeah. is that they acquired it in 2010? Why is that relevant? To what because, in 2011? because for a partnership to be formed, the business has to be carried out in common with a view to profit. If, if, if for example, this was, this was acquired with Fairlight, let's assume, but this, is, this is not the facts of this case, but I'll, I'll, I'll exaggerate the facts to illustrate the point. Assume that when the acquisition was made, Fairlight had a firm fixed intention to actually just buy out Mark Rice's share um, and keep the painting and, and to hang it uh, on, on, Mr. Kovitz could hang it on the wall in Fairlight Hall. Um, then, then you wouldn't be able to say that Fairlight is in this business in common with a view to profit, because actually it would be acquiring the painting to keep. Yes, yeah, so this goes back to your point as to, it's not necessarily clear, but it does look, again, looking at the pleading, um, Page 293 is if the partnership said to have been created at the time of purchase, not at the time when the onward sale or consignment to Sotheby's was released. Is that right? Yes, and it, and it would also be very, very odd if you acquire co owners. Yes. I mean, I suppose in it theory it would be possible to start as co owners and become partners. But no, there would be some evidence as to the, 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 why it changed. Exactly, and you'd have to identify the point of so which the, the, the case that you were having to meet was that um, this was partnership property from the moment it was bought. Yes. So, so there's no, as I said, no attempt to actually, in, in the judgment, to actually grapple with these three requirements, to go through them and tick them off, and, and then say, right, because I've ticked all three, uh, there was a partnership. So starting with paragraph 26, um, this is an attempt to summarize the positions of the parties. Um, the actual quoted words are taken uh, from part of Fairlight's closing uh, at trial. Although, in fact, rather than uh, what, what, he, what the bit from Fairlight's closing is itself a quote from an, an authority. Um, so actually, if you want to see what Fairlight's case was, uh, you really need to look at the skeleton. And that's for two reasons. One, because there it's spelled out in more detail. And, and two, because as is, as is often the way, the closing is more of a sort of note. It supplements the skeleton rather than replacing it. So if we can take out the supplemental bundle at tab 
23. Now, I, I have my supplemental bundle as one bundle, but it may be that your lordship and your lady have two supplemental bundles. We have it divided into two, and the second volume begins at the end. Yes, this will be in the second, this will be in the second volume. Tab 17, please. There was some, some movement in the bundles, partly because we weren't sure whether it was going to be live or remote, so we had PDF bundles, and then those were replaced by other ones, then hard copies. So. Hopefully we've all ended up. Well, I didn't get one of those. It's so. a, a very smart case. <laughs> so um, we have the um, what's called the opening uh, skeleton of the second defendant, starting at tab twenty-three. Uh, sorry, I thought you said tab twenty-six. But oh, no, that, that's, that's the, the part of the tab twenty-three, anyway. Is the uh, I certainly meant tab twenty-three. No, I'm, I may I have that. said twenty-six, yeah. but I certainly meant twenty-three. Yeah. Uh, and the relevant passage starts on page 272. No. No. <laughs> Sorry, 372. No, that, that, uh, that was definitely my mistake, and there's no excuse for it. Um, it does start on page 372. Uh, a paragraph 49. But well, the passage begins at paragraph 45. That means the question no. is... Up. The whole the whole passage does. Yes, um, I was just rather than take you through the, no. the, the whole of it, I was just going to draw your attention. Um, so it goes from forty five through seventy two. The issue of partnership in the, in the open. That's right, and in the interest of time, I certainly wasn't planning no. to take you through all of that. But it was a substantial written submission. It, it was yes, and, and picking up at three seventy two, paragraph forty nine. You see, the point is made that if MLW and Fairlight had not resolved what they were to do with the property, there could scarcely have been a relation between them that would bring them within the scope of the statutory definition of partnership. They could not rationally be said to have had a relation subsisting between them carrying on a business in common with a view to profit. No business was being carried on. It had not even been resolved at that stage whether Fairlight would keep the property and buy out MWL's share or whether they would sell the property to a third party. So, so this is the this is addressing the particular transaction, and it's saying no business was being carried on at all. And then if we move on to paragraph fifty-three. So you mean the particular transaction? You mean the purchase? The the, the purchase. Yes. In in June two thousand and ten. Yes. And then moving on to, to paragraph fifty-three. The, the conclusion was drawn as taking the whole of the documents, the whole of the evidence, and drawing appropriate inferences. Fairlight say the true position is this. Fairlight and MWL each ran separate businesses on their own individual accounts that were independent of each other. So just pausing there, that's not focused on, on the particular transaction. <coughs> that's, that's speaking in general terms. Uh, I, pers I, I don't accept, actually, that, that Fairlight would what Fairlight does would qualify as a business at all for the purposes of the Partnership Act, but that doesn't actually matter for present purposes. The point being made here is that if, we, if we're going to call it a business, what Fairlight does, Fairlight has one business, MWL has a different business. And, and, and then he explains Fairlight was a vehicle. So doesn't that part of, forgive me, I know you're mm. thinking about this, you, your opening submission was um, uh, Fairlight was not a business. Mm. But it was certainly being presented as a business uh, to the judge, wasn't it? Yes, and that, so this is what I'm saying. I, I wouldn't accept this as a business in, as, in the sense of sufficient to satisfy the business requirement of the Partnership Act. No, I understand but, you're saying that there's a, there, there wasn't a but, partnership. Yeah. There wasn't a business in common, yeah. but this does rather undermine your opening submission, doesn't it? Yeah, which is why I'm, why I'm drawing your attention to this now, because I said, that although. What's being said in general terms, in, if business is the correct term for what, because if you then go on and say what Fairlight, in the, when that quote business is described, it's a vehicle to facilitate Mr. Kowitz's private collection of artworks and to sell artworks on occasion for Mr. Kowitz. Mm -hmm. So, but so not in if, common. But not in certainly common. not in common. No, and that, so that's the point that's really being being made here. It does sound slightly undermine what you said. It, uh, it does, ab ab absolutely. I accept this. Uh, that's what I'm saying. There's a slight difference in emphasis. Where in that at, at trial, uh, the emphasis, emphasis is definitely on the in common. 
Whereas I'm, I'm actually putting, I still emphasize and rely on the in common. That's still probably the, the most important. <coughs> Well, you, you say you're entitled to do that based on 49. Yes. Yeah. So, and so in relation to this work of art, the specific point is absolutely, paragraph 49, there was no business when the work of art was acquired. Um, so well, that would very much depend on whether you view it by itself or as part of an ongoing relationship which already has had various transactions and so forth. But again, that's part of what the judge would have had to consider. I, mean, yes. I don't know quite whether it was put as a, a one-off or as a continuation of a partnership which had begun at, a, at an earlier stage. Um, perhaps it was never really spelled out. Well, it was certainly not, certainly not part of it. Was, it was nobody's case that there was a, there was a partnership up and running no. well, okay. before it, it, yes. this right. acquisition. Yep. More that the transaction might gain colour from the surrounding circumstances because there was evidence of the surrounding circumstances. Well, the, the judge certainly referred to the evidence of Mr. Weiss, which the effect was well in line with how we'd done things previously. Mm. Uh, we were going to split things 50-50. Um, but the, 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 the pleaded case, well, which my lady's already taken, taken us to, was that you, you infer from the facts of this particular acquisition that a partnership came into existence. So, 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 so you can see that the, the Fairlight's case at trial was that certainly at the time of the acquisition, no business was being carried on. And generally, whatever they, Fairlight and MWL were up to, it wasn't a business in common because they each just did things for their own account. Then the relevant, the actual, so I can, I'll just show you where the, um, the, the quoted words come from so you can see their origin. It's in the next tab, tab 24. Um, you see the, it's called the closing skeleton. It's more, uh, I think Sotheby's calls there's a closing note or note on evidence. But anyway, the paragraph one, the written closing submissions is to be considered in conjunction with Fairlight's written opening together with everything else. That, that's not surprising because this is a much shorter document, uh, 11, 11 pages. And the relevant passage, the quotation comes from um, paragraph 8 on page 42. You see, their partnership mischaracterizes the relationship. That's why some Mr. Kovitz used Fairlights as a vehicle, but sale, no time do they carry on a single business in common. On a true analysis, Fairlight and MWL were carrying on a separate business wholly independently. So those, those are the words that are quoted in the judgment. And they're in quotes here because they're taken from Thames Water and Wheeler. Which had, and, and the sentence and really quite, should say carrying on separate businesses. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but because, the, because, yeah, because he's lifted the words from an authority, if yeah. you then lift them from this document in isolation, it, it's rather confusing. But if you trace it back through to the skeleton and they actually look at the authority, it's rather clearer, clearer what is meant. Um, so, so that's. Um, that, I just wanted to show you where that, where those words came from. Uh, in the judgment, if we then is um, Thames Water in the authorities? Or? It, it, it's it's not. Can no. you give us a reference to it in that case, just in case we want to follow it up? If not now, perhaps um, I can't. I can't Thank now. You. It was in the bundle of authorities for um, uh, for, the, for trial, but, but yeah, mindful let's, let's of our. Let's spend time on it now. Sure. We, we can find it. Yeah. If we need to. I mean, they, they are all available electronically. If it would help, um, we, we could actually provide the, the bundles of authorities that were available uh, to the trial judge. Were they in the, it was Thames Water in the original bundles that we got. We got three authority bundles anyway. Was it in there? Oh. Ooh. If, it, if it is, we may still have it. No, I think, so, so there was, no. so there was <laughs> sort of the process of s slimming down. Obviously, when you, the, the rules are quite uh, strict for what you should and shouldn't do. For, yes, well, the last thing I want to encourage is yes. submission of unnecessary authorities. <laughs> so, so there was one process of slimming, and, that, and then a, the, the slight delay in the production of the bundles, as we all discussed how we could further, 
further slim the authorities bundle and, and ended up with just 10 authorities plus the statutory and academic material. So, um, or actually, no, it was 10, and then one got added in, and we're back up to 11. So, so we're close. Um, anyway, that's back to the judgment. So that's 26. I was just showing you where, where, that, where that comes from. Yes. And then the judgment, paragraph 27, says the evidence is not as complete as it might be. And in any event, the question is not decisive, given the conclusion reached on privity. However, had a conclusion on the question been necessary, I would have found it in favor of Sotheby's argument. So this, this is essentially, although he says it's can, said as a, as a conditional, I would have done. But um, that, 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 is, that is the conclusion that we are challenging. Um, now he says the evidence is, is not as complete um, as it might be. Um, I'll just make two points briefly in relation to that. Firstly, obviously, the burden is on the person alleging partnership to produce the evidence necessary to establish it. Um, if there's not sufficient evidence, then that burden is not discharged. I mean, I'm not suggesting this is a burden of proof case, but that's a, that's a short point. The second point is this. Whilst I accept that the evidence is not what one would expect if there was a partnership, it is what one would expect if there was no partnership. And, and the point being that if you have a partnership, you'd expect to see certain things that are absent. And the fact that they are absent, absent doesn't mean you have less evidence than you would expect. It's Sorry, an I, indicator. I, I, it's my fault completely. Hmm. What's the point? The, the point is that the judge says there's not as much evidence. The evidence is not as complete as it might be. I'm saying, well, if there was a partnership, you might expect to see more evidence. But actually, the, if there's not a partnership, there are certain things that you wouldn't expect to see. So the fact they're absent doesn't mean the evidence isn't complete. It's actually an indication that there isn't a partnership. So for example, if there's a partnership, you might expect to see partnership accounts. Uh, well, do you get a written partnership agreement? To yes. So the fact that you don't have a written partnership agreement, you don't have partnership accounts, you don't have a partnership bank account. There's not the evidence not being as complete as it might be. Right, so it's not a neutral observation. No. It's, it's actually evidence that there is no partnership. So, uh, and I mean, in relation to partnership accounts, for example, I'll, I'll give you the, the reference um, to. Well, Mr. Kovitz um, gave evidence on this, and I don't think this was challenged, that Fairlight accounted for its share of the profits in its own accounts, but that partnership accounts were never even contemplated. There was no discussion about we need to prepare some partnership accounts. And in relation to the, because there were obviously significant money flows uh, when this um, painting was sold to Nevada. We can see that actually the money went to Mark Weiss Limited, and then Mark Weiss Limited transferred some to Fairlight, and some, in fact, directly to Mr. Kovitz. Uh, and you can see that if I just show you uh, briefly um, some of the contemporaneous documents. Uh, they are in the supplemental bundle, tab one, starting on page 87. Eighty-seven is just a covering email. I'm just showing you um, this so you could make to help make sense of the document that follows. You'll it's see one, it, it's it, one of your points that this deals with reconciliation for lots of things outside the alleged part. That that is one of my points. Nice wine, very yes. nice wine, yeah. and uh, and other paintings. Yes, and, and so on this document you just see the attachment is the Weiss House House reconciliation. But yes, my lady, you have you have the point. You go over the page, and you can see it's a reconciliation not just in relation to the house, but in uh, columns F and G, you will see a, a, a number of other items that are identified. Um, Why would that speak one way or the other? Well, because if, if there was a part, if there were partnership accounts, you'd expect to be, well, we bought the house, this is what we spent, these are expenses we incurred, <coughs> this, is, this, is, this is the, um, the, the net revenue we've received on sale, deduct the various expenses, and, and it would just deal that would be with a that partnership that was limited as pleaded to the individual to transaction. The 
individual transaction. But had the, oh. had the allegation been that there was a general partnership operating, then the presence of other oh, absolutely. items might speak in favour of that conclusion. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but here it's also more complicated, because although this, this account isn't clear, you can see it when we come to the payment instructions, uh, this isn't just an account between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. It's also an account between Mark Weiss Limited and David Kovitz personally. Um, so not only does it involve other works of art, but it involves other parties. Um, you can see from uh, page 88, uh, column C, about halfway. Th this is quite a, sometimes this document is difficult to follow, partly because of the printing, the, the spreadsheet doesn't, the, 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 when they're printed, the spreadsheet pages don't look the same as they do when you look at them on a screen. Partly because sometimes the currencies get models, mu I'm sorry, muddled. So in column C, line 16, you see 50% sale proceeds. That, that should be a US dollar figure. But 50% of the sale proceeds was $5.375 million. Then over uh, onto page 92, you then see the payment uh, instructions given by uh, Mr. Kovitz to Mark Weiss Limited. And just to put this into context, you'll see, so here are the instructions, sorry for multiple wires. As for numbers, I used updated values for sterling and euros. This resulted in about a 20,000 reduction in the dollar amount you owe me. I'm also awarding you a 100,000 pound bonus for the work well done. For that, you owe me a great meal with some ridiculous wines. And then what you have is three different transfers. The first is into, uh, into his account, uh, the New York City Bank. The second is two different transfers because they're two different currencies into, a, into client accounts with Turner Mackerel Garrett. And it's the third one that's the important one. The third one is the $5.215 million into my account at Fairlight Art Ventures as follows. So, that, so that's, the, that's the payment to Fairlight after the painting has been sold. Now that figure of uh, 5.215 215 million is 50% of the gross sale proceeds minus $160,000. And the $160,000 is the dollar equivalent of the £100,000 bonus that Mr. Kovitz says he's awarding uh, Mark Weiss Limited. And you can see that from the sentence immediately below the bank details on page 93 that less $160,000 bonus. So mathematically, that's how you arrive at 5215. You take half the proceeds, you knock off the bonus, and, and what's left is being transferred to Fairlight. What's, in, what's inconsistent about that with the partnership alleged? Well, what, this is inconsistent. What you see, if, if, if you're doing partnership accounts, you would take the gross proceeds and you would deduct all of the expenses and you'd share the profits equally. But here what you have is Fairlight being paid 50% of the gross proceeds. Indeed, not, not netted off. No. Yeah. Yes. So the, the other expenses are being taken into account in the accounting between Mark Weiss Limited and Mr. Kovitz. But the payment to Fairlight is simply gross proceeds minus a bonus of 160,000. I see. Um, um, Francis Roberts, this is, is this, she's a PA or something, Mr. Kovitz. Uh, I, I will. I will check that, yes. Yeah, PA is correct. So that bundle, we will um, need to come back to another tab in that bundle in a moment. But, but reverting now to the judgment, we've looked at 27. And we then look to 28 and 29. 28, first sentence, um, the interest of MWL and Fairlight in the painting was indivisible. Now, it's not actually clear what the judge means by this. If he means that the painting is indivisible, well, that's not in dispute. You certainly wouldn't want to cut the painting in half. But if he means the interests of each party are indivisible in the sense that neither can deal with its own interest, so for example, neither can sell its 50% share or, or use it as security or whatever. 
then there's no this, this finding comes out of nowhere. I mean, this, this, there's no basis for this finding. It's not an automatic or even a normal consequence of co-ownership of an indivisible asset. Now, uh, and Mr. Kowitz gave evidence that Fairlight was in fact free to deal with its interest, and the judge hasn't addressed that. If he, if he has uh, rejected it, he doesn't expressly say so, and he hasn't said why. Now, it's accepted that if there was a partnership, then neither partner was free to deal with its share of okay, the interest. He did, he did address, address that point, didn't he, obliquely at power 30? Well, I, obliquely, I'm, I'm going to come on to paragraph right, 30. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but that's where yeah. he addresses with the charging. Yes, but what he, what he hasn't said is, I reject uh, the evidence that you were entitled to do this. What he said is, oh, well, you did it, but that's just it's one thing. It's only thing. indivisible if it's a partnership. Yeah. Yes, I mean, well, it says you, the, the statement is, 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 is begging the question that he was considering. Exactly. Mm. So, I mean, you, you, you beat me to it. Well, you can't simply assume an incident of partnership and then rely on that in order to conclude that there is a partnership. You actually have to look at the facts and apply the law and say, well, in order to determine whether or not um, the interest was indivisible. And furthermore, it's also that that's also it's, it's not enough because when you go on to the next paragraph, paragraph 29, he there refers to section 2.1 of the Act, but uh, but he refers to it but appears to pay no heed to it. That's the first statutory rule, because section 2.1 of the fact, of the Act makes it clear that, a, and I'm going to focus on one bit of it, mm. makes it clear that joint tenancy, where interests are properly described as indivisible. Even if you have a joint tenancy and you share profits, that does not necessarily make a partnership. So he's, he's he, he, so he does refer to that, but 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 doesn't. There's no. The, you can't trace through how he's got to the conclusion that the interests are indivisible, or how this feeds into his conclusion that there was a partnership. Well, that, now moving on to paragraph thirty. Um, First sentence is Fairlight adduced evidence of how it used its interest in the painting to provide security, suggesting that this was inconsistent with partnership. Well, with respect, that's not just a suggestion. Um, if it used its interest as security, that is inconsistent with partnership. It's not just a, it's either it shows that there wasn't a partnership and each party could actually use its own interest. A bit like the Lindley and Banks example we just looked at, where one of the alleged partners transferred an interest in the property to his son. Now, you, you can't do that if it's a partnership. So either it's evidence that there wasn't a partnership, mm. or if there was a partnership, it was inconsistent with it because it was a clear breach of Section 20 of the Partnership Act, which says you can only use partnership assets for partnership business. Then second sentence, he says, it's a piece of evidence to be taken with others. Um, I mean, in a sense, that's correct. Um, but, but what other evidence is the judge referring to? Because this is actually the only piece of concrete evidence as to how the parties viewed their interests in the painting, i.e. could they use them for their own purposes or, 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 or could they only use them for, quote, partnership business, unquote. And what we don't have is any evidence of a similar nature to weigh against it. So for example, there's, there's, there's no evidence of, of this alleged firm being referred to as the owner. There's no evidence that this alleged firm actually itself used the painting as security for firm borrowings. That's for the simple reason that there was no, I mean, the real reason is there was no firm. There were no, there were no partnership accounts. There was no partnership bank account. The partnership couldn't borrow, couldn't borrow money because it didn't even have an account. So then moving on to the next sentence, in my view, uh, it carries little weight in the present case as a single activity. Now, I accept that there, it is just a single activity, but there's nothing else of substance to actually weigh against it. As we shall see in the paragraphs that follow, what the judge eventually just relies on is Mr. Weiss's use of the word partner in some of the correspondence and the evidence. Before leaving 30, when, when the judge says as a single activity, that, that is the charging. Yes. Yes. 
Well, at least that's what I understand. It's not the transaction um, involving the painting, it's no. the charging of the painting. I think he says that the charging of the painting is a single activity. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, which, which, which show, it's a single activity in the sense it's the one example of, of a party using its interest in the painting for its own purposes. Do we actually know the machinery by which this security was provided? I mean, was it actually by a charge with a third party? The, uh, uh, I think the... Or something? I mean, if so, one would expect an independent third party to have investigated a bit the title of um, Fairlight to the half share in the picture which it was intending to charge. And that would, one might think, have involved excluding any possibility of it being a partnership asset. I, yeah, I don't in, know. In, in fairness, the charging point then it's the judge, the charging point is slightly old because the charge is dated January 2010. Yes. So the four purchase. Oh, and yeah. the point is simply that it was fell, the painting fell within the description of the property, the subject of the charge. Yes. Right. That that, that, that's right. And the charge is in the supplemental yes. bundle. So we see page 17 yep. of the supplemental bundle with reference to artwork. But uh, it can't be said, well, there's no evidence to suggest that the painting was in the express contemplation of no, certainly the painter wasn't. Could couldn't have been. Um, actually, let me just get the the the, the, um, well, the date. Yeah, yeah, the eighth of January, twenty ten. So several months before the painting was purchased. But then, when we move on to the subsequent paragraphs, what you see is essentially, as I said, the judge just relying on the fact that well, Mr. Weiss uses the word word partner. And paragraph, but just before we get there, paragraph 31, this is where there is a reference to the draft uh, agreement that was drawn up after the acquisition of the painting. Um, that draft agreement is also in the supplemental bundle. Uh, in tab 1 at page 48. Or at least the We've got no heat around, around the, did it have a response to the email or, or any evidence as to what happened? No, we, well, there's some evidence from Mr. Weiss is, is that he was sort of a little surprised by it, but not, not he doesn't say, I, I disagreed with the no partnership provision. In, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to what Mr. Weiss says uh, about his draft, but we know it wasn't signed. But paragraph, uh, page 48, you see this is the covering email. Um, where there's reference to the acquisition by Fairlight is to be held on behalf of your company, which we assume to be Mark West Limited. The funding was provided by David. He's asked us to prepare an agreement. Uh, and then the draft agreement starts at 49. Um, ownership of the artwork is addressed on page 50 and over on to, sorry, 51 and over on to 52. In section two, at the very bottom of page 51, ownership of the artwork and over the page Fairlight confirms that it holds the artwork on behalf of itself and MWL jointly with each party having a 50% interest in the artwork. Uh, there's then, we don't need to look at the provisions about the, the French state right to purchase. There's section five on 53 is the allocation of sale proceeds. Um, where you'll see A, Fairlight should be entitled to re retain 50% of the gross sale proceeds. Um, and we've seen the accounting uh, and the, the, the instructions for the payment that were consistent with that. Uh, section six, there's a reference to the loan. But the loan doesn't come from Fairlight, as you'll see here. It was, the loan is from Mr. Kowitz personally. And then over the, page 55, uh, section eight, under the heading no partnership, Nothing in this agreement should be deemed to constitute a partnership between the parties or any of them. So, so there you have certainly a, a, a statement, presumably reflecting the intentions of, of Fairlight, that there not be uh, a partnership. Now, I accept, as I must, that this carries less weight than would a signed agreement, which included a similar provision. Forgive but me if you've already told us, but what, what's the date of the email from the solicitor? 48. I will. It's the 
acceptable use. Uh, probably looking at it. No, it's, it's, the debates have been cut off for some reason. But they're in the index. That is, that is right. 7th of August, 2010. 7th of August, 2010. Thank you. And so what we do say is that this, this indicates or evidences uh, one party's understanding of the uh, and intentions in relation to the agreement that were being reached um, and again, you can see from this agreement, just as you can see from the accounting documents we looked at earlier, that the relationships were far more complicated than a simple profit share from a one-off transaction between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. Uh, David Kovitz was personally involved. Uh, this agreement intended to join Mark Weiss personally as well, but he never signed it, so he wouldn't have incurred any liabilities as a guarantor. Moving on then in the judgment, uh, paragraph 32, he says, the language of partner was used between Mr. Weiss and Mr. Kovitz. In some cases, that does not take one very far. But in the present case, my assessment is that the choice of language had meaning. Mr. Kovitz was reluctant to accept this, but I found him a witness who was guarded in areas and he appreciated it, that he appreciated the difficult the case he wished to uh, succeed. Now, this is the way you get to the matters that really swayed the judge. Um, essentially, because the word partner was occasionally used, the judge concluded that a statutory partner existed. Now, we, we say that Mr. Weiss using the term partner in an email does not help determine whether or not there was a statutory partnership. Uh, and it's not clear from this, obviously, it's not clear what documents the judge had in mind. Um, we've got some of the, uh, we don't have obviously all the contemporaneous records in the appeal bundle, but we do see the word partner appears twice in emails that are in the bundle that were authored by Mr. Weiss. The, the, the first of those is in the supplementary bundle, tab one, page 59. And here, this is an email from Mr. Weiss to Mr. Kovitz. Um, and, and here, in fact, the relevant the words appear not when he's using his own words, and he's not actually describing his relationship with, um, with, with Mr. Kovitz or with Fairlight. He's, he's talking about, he's, trans, he's providing, providing a translation of a document provided by the Louvre. And in the penultimate uh, paragraph, you will see at the end of the penultimate paragraph, France does not possess a painting comparable to this national treasure, which is why the Louvre today seeks to acquire it through the support of private partners. So here you have obviously the word partner being used in a different context. I accept this is not this isn't this is Mr. Weiss providing a translation and it's not addressing his relationship. But but the word partner only appears twice in, in the contemporaneous documents in the bundle. So that's the first one. The second one, which is more important, is in page page sixty-eight of tab one. And this is an email to Sotheby's sent on the 20th of June 2011, but just before contract A is concluded, where he says, Dear James, thank you very much for the written confirmation that I've forwarded on to my partner, David, and I am talking to him first thing in the morning. Uh, then, so, Points to be made here. He's certainly not saying Mark Weiss Limited is in a partnership with Fairlight. He's referring to Mr. Kovitz as my partner, and he's referring to himself, he appears to be referring to himself personally. So again, he's using the word partner sort of informally to describe a relationship between him and Mr. Kovitz. He's not using it to say there is a partnership between Mark Weiss Limited and Fairlight. Well, from a different context, one might um, uh, socially introduce somebody as my partner, but you might not be their civil partner, still less their husband or their wife. Uh, ab absolutely. And it's an illustration of how the fact that partner is used in lots of different ways in different contexts. 
But here, this, this plainly doesn't find support for a statutory partnership. It's not even referring to the right parties. Absolutely. And the earlier reference was just to the Louvre yeah. doing something in yeah. connection with partners, which just means someone collaborating with you. I mean, it doesn't yes. carry any legal connotation. Yeah. And there you saw it, it means people who are going to provide funding. Yeah. And, and, and that's essentially what we say Mr. Weiss meant here, because Mr. Kovitz personally provided him with the funding by way of loan that enabled him to buy his 50% share. And in fact, in other documents, he describes the relationship very differently. When he goes into a bit more detail, you see the word partner disappears. And what you have, if you turn back in this bundle to page 62, it, this is an email, again, unfortunately, the, the the date's been cut off, but March 2011. I'm grateful you're quicker to the index than yeah, I. Just, I just popped up. Right. <laughs> I, was, I, I wish it had popped up for I'll me. Have it. Um, <laughs> the, so this is a, a March email from Mark Rice um, to, 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 to Fritz. I'm not to Park, I think, but I'm, uh, I, in a way, it doesn't matter who it's sent to. It's what, what he says at the beginning of the second paragraph. He says, as I mentioned, I am the co-owner of the fantastic house portrait, which the Louvre has classified as a trésor national. So there he's describing himself as a co-owner rather than uh, I, I have a firm that owns this or I'm part of a partnership. And then in, in the next paragraph down the first line, he says, I bought the painting with the assistance of my best client who may yet decide he wants to keep the painting for himself. So when he's not using partner as a shorthand, this is how he actually described the relationship at the time. And, and, and would, would, um, would that be consistent with the partnership, um, the ability of the best client to decide to keep the picture himself? That would be inconsistent with the partnership. Right, because, yes. because he, the, the, whether or not he was the best client, he wouldn't have the right to insist. No. If, if uh, it was partnership property. Well, it, when, uh, I, uh, I don't when know says, if that's right, but I just asked. When he, I mean, you're right. A partner can't can't, can't insist uh, on um, taking partnership property. That's certainly true. But it's it actually goes to a slightly different point because, of course, here Mr. Kovitz or Fairlight couldn't actually insist on keeping the entire painting because they'd have to agree a price with Mark Weiss. <coughs> um, if, if you look at Mr. Melman's email at 65, you see the context. Then you say the suggestion here isn't that he could. Fairlight could direct the show, but there could be a mutual agreement between partners. Yes. That Fairlight could buy MWL out. Yes. Which is what seems to have been being discussed here. Yeah. So there's a there's, and as we see, I mean that that's one document, and I'll take you briefly while we're on this topic because this this op this option was also discussed before the painting was acquired. It wasn't just coming up in 2011 when they're deciding what to do with it. If you just go back quickly, I'll just uh, to page 29 in this. Time. You can see some of the negotiations. In fact, I, I, I alluded um, to, to one, of the, one of these emails earlier. This, so this is um, at the time that the painting is being acquired now. So we're back at the acquisition rather than the sale stage. And Mr. Kovitz is saying to Mark Weiss, how about something like this? We buy for 3.3. And then the end of that paragraph says, Kovitz sends Weiss 1.15. Uh, if Louvre buys, we split the profits. And you see various options, and it's just above the hole punch. If exported, DK has the option to buy a picture for 3.9 million euros, i.e. giving Weiss a profit of 600,000. And then the next paragraph, if we decide to sell it, we can figure out a fair split. Maybe it just, just ship it to Sotheby's, we probably split evenly. If sold to a private at a great price, maybe 60, 40 in favor of Weiss. So these are the discussions that are going on. Uh, and then over on the next page, you see the first of Mr. Weiss's responses. And he says, as I've said, the problem with you having option of 3.9 million is that on the old deal, so, uh, I would expect you to have given me an additional amount anyway if you'd kept it. So I'd be no better off, even though I now own 50%. Uh, I'm entering into this new venture on the basis that I will have the opportunity to sell this painting for a much larger profit. So this is the point it came up. Uh, about 50 minutes ago, um, was this a continuation of a previous course of dealing, or is it new? And this is the email, which I didn't have to hand then, but establishes that this is this is a new venture. 
And in the second response, it's over the page on page 31. In my view, since my much deeper involvement in this painting is on the basis of selling it to a third party other than DK, and since, for reasons we know, your option will not kick in for at least a year, at which point the Louvre situation is resolved one way or another, and the painting is out of France or sold, we're best not putting a definitive value on your put option. It should, however, be based more on a willing buyer, willing seller basis, and reflect a fair and equitable discount on the amount I could realistically expect to achieve for the painting on the international market display with great excitement at Masaryk as a fabulous discovery. So these are the sort of discussions you see taking place. Now, no, no agreement. They didn't agree a, a, a purchase option value. Um, but but what say, you can see. The, the picture that suggests to me really pretty strongly is that joint acquisition between two people who have a background of business connections of one kind or another and obviously intend to turn this acquisition to account in various ways, but you then get discussions which are inconclusive. Yes. Um, but without any hint of a partnership relationship as such, um, but more just as these discussions show, canvassing of various possibilities um, as to how the co-owners sort of turn it to, well, to use it, turn it to account for their mutual advantage. Yes, uh, and, and, uh, and you can see those discussions were still happening a year later. I, I took you to the March email, and my lady referred to the document at 65, which provides more context for the discussions that were taking place. So even then, Mark Weiss Limited is still thinking of selling to Fairlight. And, and that's how Mark Weiss Limited is going to make its profit by selling its interest to Fairlight so Mr. Kovitz can hang this painting on his wall. So um, then going back to the judgment, uh, Picking it up at paragraphs 33 and 34. Uh, here the judge is referring to Mr. Weiss's evidence for trial. You see there's various bits uh, that are quoted. Those are taken from Mr. Weiss's witness statement. How did Fairlight get round the point that it was calling Mr. Weiss's own I'm not sure that it, it got round it. It, it, do, it, it. it put in his statement and, 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 said, and set, said took the judge when it, when rely on him for the good bits and uh, ignore him on the bad bits well, for us. Well, uh, no, no, I'm not, because you can't do that unless, of course, you, I mean, you, you, there are ways of achieving that. You, you put in a Civil Evidence Act notice that just identifies the particular passages that you want to rely on. The whole statement. Uh, th that wasn't done here. The whole statement was, was done. But the reason that could be done is because the law is clear that somebody using the word partner does not create a partnership. Right. Um, but the, yes, but this is more substantive than just a passing reference. We would purchase as partners. Yes. So, anyway, but, yes. There it is. And if if the, if his use of that word was determinative of the issue, um, then that would have been a, a, t a tactical error. But of course, his use of the word is not determinative. You actually have to look at the nature of the transaction and the dealings. But also, what what you have here is some highly high, highly um, se selective. Um, quotations from the statement. Because if we actually look at that, it's in the supplemental bundle at tab five. We, we can see what Mr. Weiss said. And you can judge for yourselves whether or not it was a statutory partnership. Um, the, If we, uh, it's, in, it's in tab five, if we could um, pick it up uh, at page 160, you'll see there the heading, MWL and Fairlight purchase of the painting. It says, since the eventual asking price was an amount I could not afford, my first thought was to offer it to my then best client and close friend, David Kovitz, on the basis that he would buy the painting for his collection with 10% commission to Mr. Capuzio and a further 15% commission to me. I'd known Mr. Kovitz over 10 years. He'd begun as an avid collector of contemporary art, and it was from me that he made his very first purchase of Old Master, a portrait of an unidentified Swiss sitter in around 1997. Our relationship quickly blossomed. He became my most important client as both a collector of paintings and also a financier of stock whereby he could fund a purchase, and we would then share the profit once the painting had sold. As a matter of course, such arrangements, expenses were deducted from the sale price before the profit was shared, 
generally at a 50-50 split. There he's describing uh, the relationship. And um, he's describing the relationship, which obviously it's, it's a dealer-client relationship, but it's a deeper relationship than most dealers will have with their clients, because it's not simply Mark Weiss Limited selling um, to Mr. Kovitz. And then if we um, move over on the next page, I don't want to take this too slowly, but then nor do I want to take it too quickly. So, so please, if you think I'm doing it at the wrong pace, please um, either feed me along or slow me down. Paragraph 42. Uh, on 20th of May, Mr. Kovitz and I saw the painting. Once in front of it, I talked to Mr. Kovitz through all I knew about the work and expressed my opinion that a price of 3.75 million was an attractive deal for him. It's so just pausing there. You see the 3.75 million was anticipating, at this stage, he's anticipating just getting a commission for introducing Mr. Kovitz. He would make a healthy 1.25 million profit in a year or so time if the Louvre was successful or end up keeping for his own collection. This great new discovery of what I consider to be a good price. Then over the page at 53, um, this is where there's reference to the draft agreement that gets sent. Around this time, on 8th of July, I received an email from Mr. Kovitz's lawyers proposing to put together an agreement to deal with the ownership profit sharing arrangement. I was somewhat taken aback by the proposal. I certainly did not think one was necessary. My understanding was that, in line with our previous practice, we would purchase the painting as partners, deduct any expenses, and split the remaining profit. <coughs> Obviously, the judge picks up on the use of the word as partner. But we say you could, you could, his use of the word as partner doesn't determine this issue. And, and, and we've seen from the contemporaneous evidence that this, this deal was different from their previous deals. Because, because well, in this one, Mr. Mark Weiss Limited was going in as a 50% owner, something being bought by Fairlight. In any event, I point out this Covet's lawyer at the time, I cannot be comprehens it cannot be comprehensive, it does not cover what would happen if the French state did not buy the painting. I will also explain that in the event of such a situation, I would seek to be reimbursed Fairlight DK's share of the marketing costs as we put the painting forward for sale. This is accorded with all our previous dealings where he had funded acquisition. This is a point of detail which makes no difference to anything, but in this statement, he, uh, Mr. Weiss says the uh, draft agreement was received on the 8th of July. The index suggests that the email at 48 was sent on the 7th of August. I think they've people, it's the Amer American dating and timing, so the correct date of the document at 48 is the 8th of July, that is not the 7th of August. That is probably right, in that I'm sure that that point was focused on when this, um, well, they would have had the email where you could actually yes. see, the, see the date yes. um, when this statement was prepared. Thank you. So, so he's there referring back to the previous, the stock financing arrangements that he has, um, refer, that, we, we, that we just looked at in paragraph 33. Um, then the next relevant passage is paragraph at least on this issue, is paragraph 70, where he's now moving on from the acquisition to the sale. And he says, at this point, I was starting to think about potential buyers. As it was becoming ever clearer that Louvre would not be able to raise the necessary funds. The two real options seemed to me either that Mr. Kovitz would buy me out of my share at a sum close to market price, or that we would sell it to a third party. I would have preferred the former. I was passionate about the painting, given my commitment to Mr. Kovitz and his collection. I felt strongly that he should keep the work. Given that this was by no means a foregone conclusion, however, I drew up a list in my mind of third party possibilities. So, so to put this into uh, actually one last passage before I withdraw this together, uh, paragraph 88 on page 165. Ms. Scott's plan planned to meet around 13th of May 2011 with the intention of making a final decision as to whether he would keep the painting or we would agree to offer it to the market. By now, the painting was hanging in my office in the gallery. I believe I brought it back to London late in the evening, the 7th of May 2011, following the move failure to raise the funds necessary to purchase it. So what you see here is, even a year after the acquisition, there's still no decision about, is this going to be sold to a third party for profit, or is actually Fairlight going to buy out Mark Weiss Limited? And we say that that's wholly inconsistent with the suggestion that there was a partnership. is you can't go into business in common with a view to profit if you haven't actually decided what you're going to do with the thing. Uh, now, the next passage quoted by the judge, just so you can see where the bits of the judgment come from, uh, is in paragraph 
123 on page 167. Because now that sale was all but completed, I set about working out how the proceeds of sale should be split between Mr. B Mr. Kowitz. Um, in accordance with our agreement as partners in the transaction, we were to split the profits of the sale of the painting equitably. According, I noted down all the costs, etc. So then, there's, so that's that's is the second sentence that's reproduced in the um, judgment. But that takes matters nowhere because a 50-50 split is in fact entirely consistent with co-ownership, with each owner having a 50% 50, 50 share. It doesn't say that it's partnership rather than co-ownership. That's exactly what you'd expect even if there was no partnership. And as the rules in the Act make clear, that's not sufficient. And the final passage referred to by the judge uh, is in paragraph 126 on page 168. Um, Where, where again you see the use of the word partners, but again we say that that doesn't actually take matters anywhere. Uh, it doesn't take matters any further. Uh, and finally, before leaving this this topic, just look quickly at actually what Mark Weiss and his lawyers said when Sotheby's did threaten litigation. Um, if we turn in this tab back in tab one to page ninety nine. You see a letter from Stevenson Harwood, dated the 18th of May 2016. Now, this is significant because it's written by a well-known and respected law firm who can obviously be trusted to ascertain who their client is before they start writing letters. And so this is a letter written to Sotheby's on the 18th of May. And, and you can see for just under the heading, as you know, we act on behalf of Mark Weiss Limited. We are writing with regard to the recent events in relation to the painting. So Stevens and Harwood clearly don't think that they are acting on behalf of a firm of Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. They think they're only acting for Mark Weiss Limited. And then in the numbered paragraph one under the heading sale of the painting, on or around 23rd of June, our client, ent our client entered into an agreement with Sotheby's. The terms of the agency agreement made clear that Sotheby's would act as our client's exclusive sales agent. And there's no suggestion anywhere in the Stevenson Harwood letter uh, that they were acting on behalf of Fairlight or acting on behalf of any partnership. So we can put that away and pick up the judgment again, paragraph 35. A small point made against you is the suggestion that uh, Fairlight and NWL split their legal expenses until Part 20 proceedings were called. Is that right? Yes, I don't... Equally short, shared. It may not matter, but they yes, certainly it's a separate matter. Uh, Mr. Weiss certainly says that, and I, I, I have not explored that any further, so we would take his, his evidence as at face value. Um, then, picking it up, paragraph 35, uh, the judge says, Fairlight argued at the time of the original purchase of the painting, MWL and Fairlight had not determined what was subsequently to be done with the painting. Even if this is the case, it does not assist Fairlight, given Mr. Weiss's evidence about, above about what was agreed at the outset. Um, now, the judge starts with the words, he says, even if this was the case, which appears to be designed to cast doubt on it, but there's no possible basis for any doubt. I mean, the contemporaneous documents and Mr. Weiss's evidence are absolutely clear. One option being considered from the time of the purchase right up to shortly before the eventual sale and was for Mr. Kovitz to buy out MWL's interest. And indeed, Mr. Y says that was his preferred option. And, and it's also common ground on the pleadings. So we go to that briefly. The, it's in the core bundle the same bundle as the judgment. Um, and if we maybe keep a finger in the judgment so we can go back to it. In tab 20, uh, you see the re-amended defense of the part 20 defendant. So, so this is Mark Weiss Limited responding to Fairlight's part 20 claim. 
And immediately before the passage that my lady just referred to about an hour ago, uh, on page 294, paragraph 8a was the passage my lady referred to, with the inference that there was a partnership. But just above that, one line down, you'll see, at the date of the purchase, it had not been determined between the co-owners what was subsequently <laughs> done with the property, namely whether Fairlight should buy out MW's share of the property or whether the property should be sold to a third party. <coughs> Such discussions were ongoing until around late May 2011, when they were resolved in the manner pleaded at paragraph 12.2 above. Uh, and just for your reference, uh, that is admitted uh, in the reply in... Uh, tab 21 at paragraph 7a. Now, the judge says this is irrelevant due to Mr. Weiss's evidence about what was agreed at the outset. But the evidence about what was agreed at the outset is, is not inconsistent with this. I mean, there's common ground on the pleadings, and Mr. Weiss has made it clear that, yeah, if they sold it, they, he was looking to share, <coughs> share the profits 50 50. But but the fact is, that was only one of the options. And the judge doesn't even attempt to grapple with the impact this has on the three necessary elements of the partnership. It's how can it say that they've gone into business with a view to profit, or even gone into business in common, when their interests and possible outcomes are so different? Because if Fairlight might be buying it to give them Mr. Kovitz to hang on his wall, and won't be looking to profit at all. So again, it just all depends on the facts, doesn't it? I mean, you yes. could have a partnership where the mode of exploitation is completely undecided, but you do agree together that you will consult and eventually reach an agreement on what is the best method of turning it to account for the benefit of both of you. So, I mean, that could come within the statutory definition, even though there's no certainty from the beginning as to how yes. you're going to set about the. Um, ultimate disposal of the asset. Yes, so, so long as there is a view to profit. So you could, yeah. for example, buy, let, let's talk about a, a building. Yeah. You, might be, you might not be, decide, you, and you're going to renovate it, but you don't know at the end, are you going to sell it or are you going to rent it out? Mm. But either way, you're going to be looking to make a profit out of it. But here, one option was Fairlight didn't have a view to profit at all. It was just going to buy out the painting and keep it. So that, that's, that's, we say, yeah. the important point. Yeah. So, so turning to the three necessary ingredients part. One thing you haven't done, I, I, I looked into this very thoroughly, but um, uh, Mr. Kovitz, um, his evidence was rejected. Um, I don't think you've taken us to what his evidence actually was. Uh, the judge no, I, I, I haven't. Um, what, I, what I've instead been doing is focusing on the evidence that was actually referred to and relied on by the judge in order to demonstrate that it, it simply doesn't stack up to a conclusion well, of I mean, a partnership. I mean, normally, if some of these evidence is rejected, then the judge would um, explain why, rather than simply referring to the, to the yes. witness as a guarded witness. Um, is there any, if oh, there's no particular passage in Mr. Kovitz's evidence, then I'm not encouraging um, it. But presumably, he dealt with it in his various statements and his oral evidence. Yes, and also, I think the, the evidence is rejected was evident it was evidence about the use of the word partner and things like that so it's not it's not actually particularly significant now there, if you if there's a disagreement about whether or not agreement was reached and the judge rejects that witness's evidence then you might need to go and look to see what that witness says and, and, and decide whether the judge was right or wrong to reject it but but here you, whether or not mr Kovitz accepted the word partner is really neither here nor there um, just well, as at some point, I would just be helped. I can obviously do it for myself. But you right. Be no, I, I will. Um, I'm not. Just if we could have the references yes. to where Mr. Kovitz's evidence appears in the papers before us. Yes, we do have some extracts from his, his evidence yes, well, in I here, saw that. Uh, and I will um, identify the relevant passages. Yep. So turning then, that's the judgment. Then drawing the, th the three elements and together. Before you do that, Mr. Duncan, I would unfair to you. Wrong to say that you haven't run the additional argument below because we can see paragraph 36 you did. Yes, I was going to, and, and the reason why I'm not uh, going to focus on that point right now is that's really the, the, the privity, the privity yeah. point. Um, so how much longer are you going to be on this? I've, I'm actually just drawing things together on yes, partnership. Yes, I could yes, do it after the adjournment or.
Well, if you're just going to be a few minutes, mm -hmm. by all means, finish it now, or else you can... It would probably be, um, if, if, if you don't mind, it's probably more convenient to at least get this topic out of the way before the adjournment, but I'm in your hands. In that case, we'll keep quiet and let you right. rest the topic as quickly as you can. <laughs> so, so the first requirement is that Fairlight and MWL must be carrying on a business. Um, we say that the reasoning is totally inadequate. There's no attempt to identify or define the business that they're said to be carrying on. They, it doesn't even, there's not even a finding that they were carrying on a business. Uh, and we say in this case, um, they were not. And, and, and we also, and I've touched on this already, this is a case where you do have to think about this very carefully because one of the parties, part, partners is in the business of dealing in old master portraits. Uh, and, and it would be very important for Mark Weiss to know um, if it entered into a, another partnership, what the scope of that partnership was. And th none of these issues are addressed by the judge. And we say that when you look at the evidence that I've taken to, it's clear that they were not carrying on a business. They bought a work. I thought Mr. Weiss had a speciality in a different sort of um, antique portrait. Old master por portrait. This this was the, within the within the, the scope of his, uh, his of his own business. Because this is an old master portrait, um, and he one imagines this is the value he brought because he, because he had the contacts and was able to make the production. He, he explained. We looked at the evidence. The reason the reason he didn't buy it himself. And we looked at the fact that paragraph thirty two of his was because it was going to cost too much. He couldn't, he couldn't fund it himself. Um, so they, they were not carrying on a business. Second requirement, again, not tackled by the judge. If they were carrying on a business, was it a bit business in common? Uh, we say the answer to that is plainly no. Fairlight and MWL were each acting for their own account. Um, they were clear their interests were different. MWL was a dealer. Uh, looking to make profit in different ways. Initially, it was going to be a 15% um, commission. Then it was going to make a profit out of selling its share to Mr. Kovitz or to Fairlight. And then it was to make a profit by selling the entire painting to a third party. But, 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 but Fairlight, uh, although profit was an option if it was sold to a, a, a third party, had a very different interest because it might have become the ultimate purchaser. So they weren't in business in common. And, and thirdly, um, the requirement that it be with a view to profit, we say again, clearly is not satisfied. The correct analysis, we say, is that Fairlight and MWP were co-owners. Whilst MWP was engaged in a business, so far as the acquisition of this painting is concerned, it was its own business. It wasn't a business in common with Fairlight. And although MWP undoubtedly entered into this transaction with a view to profit, this was a view to profit for MWP, not with a view for profit for any alleged firm. Now, on, on those facts, we say there's simply no scope for a finding that there was a statutory partnership. Thank you. Does that conclude your argument on that? It, it, it does. Um, and are you still on course to finish your submissions before uh, the end of the day? I, I am actually, in terms of page count, which is not always a reliable guide, <laughs> I am exactly halfway through. Um, I was trying to speed things up a little bit right. there, and I will have to do the same this afternoon. Well, perhaps you'll discuss between yourselves the ultimate division of time and make sure that you do stop in good time to allow everybody else to have a fair crack at the word. Um, Thank you. Good. In that case, we'll continue at five past. Yes, five past two. In that case. Thank you. Good class.